I'm going to be rebranding this page once again, and I totally understand if that makes a lot of you fall off or leave the page, unfollow, that kind of thing. I get it. I fully expect it to happen. So I have changed the name to Making an Entertainment Er Er. I have to have the Er Er at the end. It's kind of like my thing now. I also had to drop the G off of making because it was one letter too long and that made me sad, but it is what it is. Anyway, I'm going to use this page to talk about entertainment stuff. Movies, TV shows, maybe occasionally video games. But I know video games is more of a specific audience where movies and television is a broader audience. So like reviews, recommendations, top whatever lists, just anything and everything movie and TV shows. Movies and television ultimately has always been my biggest passion. And I just want to do something, just have a page where it's just fun stuff. So this is my backup page again. If you click on this link, it's a clickable link in my bio. Or if you hit the link tree, it's one of the first few links, I think. Um, you can go to my primary TikTok page, which is this one, Making a True Crime Er, the original, the OG. So this one is going to be specifically true crime cases and sometimes like spooky stories like haunted places or alien stuff from time to time the way it's pretty much always been. So if you didn't know I did that, um, that's where I got started here, basically. So feel free to jump over and follow that page if you are into that kind of thing. And in both of my bios, you'll see a YouTube link. It'll take you to my YouTube channel, which is also in the link tree. Or you can search Making a True Crime Er on YouTube. Um, and I have hundreds and hundreds of videos over there, primarily long form videos, usually longer than 10 to 15 minutes. So if you're into that, by all means, join that or follow that, or what, what? I don't know, words are hard. I appreciate all of you who have joined this page. You are all fantastic, wonderful, awesome people. Alien Romulus, is it worth it? Hi, welcome to another Mikey at the Movies where I review the movie, Alien Romulus, yeah. You can actually now stream this on Hulu. That's how I watched it. This is not a sponsored post. And if you're going by chronological order, Alien Romulus takes place between the first Alien movie and Aliens. Real quick, it's rated R. It's an hour and 59 minutes long, and it has gotten fantastic reviews across the board. Deservedly so. It has a cast of pretty much unrecognizables. I don't, I don't recognize any of them. You have the main character here, who's basically kind of like your Ripley type. I mean, she's no Sigourney Weaver in Alien or Aliens, but she was still really fantastic in this. My favorite uh, actor in the movie, though, was the guy who played Andy, the android. I thought he was great. We also get our good friends, the Facehuggers, and our good old pals, the Xenomorphs, the Biggins. I'm a big fan of the first Alien movie. I love Aliens even more, like a lot of people. And I don't know if I was expecting this to kind of be on par with those two movies, but... I was very pleasantly surprised. This was a perfect like sci-fi action movie. Arguably in my just in my opinion the best one I've seen in a few years. It does it never tries to do too much. It kind of brings you back to the original almost. So you have that like nostalgic feeling towards it. Obviously there's a lot of CGI in this movie. There are some really spectacular beautiful effects especially towards the end of the film. But they stuck to their kind of their original process. I know they brought in Stan Winston, who was a big part of the originals. And a lot of the aliens in this movie are done through puppeteering, through animatronics. Uh, they have actors playing them. And so what you are seeing, what the actors are, you know, working with are actual like things. They're not reacting to like a tennis ball on a stick. And that makes it look more realistic, which actually makes it more unsettling. And it looks really fucking good. This was the perfect blend of action. It was not too long. It moved like really quick. The set pieces, the action is all top notch. And while it is not aliens, not on that level, it is still a very, very worthy uh, addition to the Alien franchise. And from what I do understand, they are going to be making another one. But if you love sci-fi, you love action, this is absolutely the movie for you. I absolutely loved this movie. If you just want to sit down for two hours, eat some popcorn, and just be entertained, this is it. This is some of the best you're going to get right now. It's absolutely worth it. But that's just my opinion. So out of a possible 500 chest bursters, I give this 499... <laughs> Is this is, is this is. So, there you go. So I guess Chris, ouch, dick. I guess Christmas horror movies are my thing now. Never expected that. This is another Mikey at the movies, and this time I watched It's a Wonderful Knife. Yep. Home Alone, you know, is the first Christmas horror movie, okay? Because Kevin McAllister, he's a fucking bloodthirsty animal. Anyway, so it came out in 2023. It's an hour and 27 minutes long. Rated R. 
A year after saving her town from a psychotic killer on Christmas Eve, Winnie Carruthers' life is less than wonderful, but when she wishes she'd never been born, she finds herself in a nightmare parallel universe and discovers that without her, things could be much, much worse. Now the killer is back and she must team up with the town misfit to identify the killer and get back to her own reality. Yep, it's another time travel horror movie. Time travel Christmas horror movie kind of comedy, I guess. It's a lot to take in, just like this. <laughs> I noticed this from the writer of Freaky. Um, I enjoyed that movie, Freaky. That one I have seen before. It wasn't amazing or anything, but it was a very enjoyable movie. So this one has, uh, you know, a cast of people you may recognize, right? It's got Justin Long. It's got Joel McHale. The cigarette smoky man was in it for like four seconds from the X-Files, which is funny because he was also in the X-Files, the reboot. Whoa. Why not? Who cares? I mean, basically the synopsis told you. She wishes on an aurora borealis that her life, that she was never born and boom, she was never born. Um, uh, I'm with the critics on this one. I, you know, like it was okay. This is the killer. What This is his costume, his get up. I was reading on IMDB that this apparently was the original look for Scream, the uh, ghost face killer. And there's a character in this movie that they named Gail Prescott. Right after after Gail Weathers and Sidney Prescott, I think. Anyway, so the entire opening sequence of the film, you know who the killer is. But then when she goes back and she, you know, to an alternate timeline, that person is still now alive. And it's no secret to the audience that that person is still the killer. But this time there may be a second killer. <gasps> Shocker. But I didn't really understand. So spoiler alert. I didn't understand. Was the killer able to mind control people? Because they didn't, two of those who have seen this, because I don't really know if they really elaborated. Because it sounds like he was mind controlling the second killer and controlling like the people of the town because at one point their eyes turned all green and shit. I didn't get, I didn't, uh, there was just too much, too much, okay? Just be a slasher movie. We're already time traveling. We don't need another supernatural element added to this. Let's just calm down. It was too convoluted. It was too just blech. And I've seen this shit before. Slasher movies have to do a lot to be like unique. And this just did not do it. Because we've even seen the time travel horror thing done already before. I don't know, I just didn't like it, I'm sorry. So out of a possible 12 billion angels of death deceases, I give this 50 loose pennies I found underneath the couch. So, there you go. Beats, Bears, Battlestar Galactica. I thought I would start a new series where I review and recommend some of my favorite TV shows in no particular order. So I'm starting with Battlestar Galactica, the 2004 version which ran for four seasons on the Sci-Fi Network. It is based off of the original Battlestar Galactica from the 1970s. I've never seen this one. I remember being really apprehensive about starting to watch this show because I thought it was going to be just like Star Trek or Star Wars with a bunch of weird aliens and just all that nonsense. But it's not that at all. As a matter of fact, it's primarily just human beings. What's it about, Mike? So the story takes place in a distant time where humans live across 12 different colonies or planets, and they're the colonies of Cobalt. Well, humans being humans, like we do, created a cybernetic species called Cylons in order to basically be slaves for humans. Well, as we've seen many times before in other movies and TV shows, that's not a great idea. Over time, the Cylons evolved and they rebelled against humans. And so the Cylons, with the assistance of a man named Gaius Baltar, launched a surprise attack on all 12 colonies, destroying basically the entire human race, except for whoever was up in space at the time of the attack, including those aboard the Battlestar Galactica. The human race has then dwindled down to about 50,000 people which consisted of the Battlestar Galactica, along with a bunch of other civilian and military ships. And they had nowhere to land because all the planets were destroyed and taken over by Cylons. And the fleet is commanded by Commander Adama. And so the premise of the show ultimately comes down to that these 50,000 people are going to find the lost 13th colony known as Earth. But here's a twist that did not occur on the original show. The Cylons adapted, right? They evolved. And there are 13 different Cylon models who look and act exactly like humans. And there are many copies. Each model has like thousands of different copies. And the opening scroll for basically every episode is, quote, the Cylons were created by man. They evolved. They rebelled. There are many copies. And they have a plan. You have a doctor named Gaius Baltar who helped the Cylons destroy all the colonies but nobody knows that. And he has these visions of one of the Cylon models named Six. She's basically convincing him to do all sorts of dastardly things. And he's trying to hide the fact that he was part of this whole thing. And so ultimately it's really a drama 
that really touches on humanity, what it means to be human. It does tackle religion a lot. It obviously tackles politics. And it's actually a much more deep show than I ever thought it would be. I was just like, oh, it's just going to be some stupid show about people shooting spaceship lasers at each other. But ultimately, it really is like a very in-depth look uh, at human nature in general, in what we would do to survive. What would you, what would you do? How far would you go? And so over the course of about four seasons, it unfolds rather brilliantly. Slowly but surely, the, the human Cylon models are revealed, including some characters you know and love that you don't know are Cylons until they reveal it much later on in the show. And basically, some of these Cylons don't even know that they're Cylons. They've been programmed that way. But there are human Cylons who are aware of what they are and are infiltrating, you know, the fleet to cause havoc and create shit. I'm pretty sure you could stream this show on Amazon Prime if you have it, but I don't know if it's anywhere else. But this was a show that I did not expect to ever get into, but I absolutely adore this show. It is seriously one of the best and most surprising things I've ever seen. You never would have thought that from a show on the sci-fi network. Does it have a beginning, middle, and end? Yes, it does. They knew the show was being canceled before season four, and so they had a plan to finish it. The ending is a little controversial. Some people loved it. Some people hated it, as is the case with many shows with huge cult followings. But I don't know. I thought I had a pretty decent ending for what it was. Anyway, check it out, nerds. Hashtag Chad Gets the Axe. Movie review. Huh? Have you heard of this movie before? I didn't until yesterday. So it's basically a horror kind of comedy, I guess, maybe? So it's an hour and 24 minutes long. Um, it only has very minimal reviews, but hey, 100% by the critics. 61% of fans liked it. So it is about four social media influencers live stream their trip to Devil's Manor, the former home of a satanic cult, but things start to go wrong because of course, as the violence increases, so do the views. So it kind of has like that found footage style to it. Actually, I would say it was more like Unfriended or the movie Host from a couple of years ago. So like the whole thing is shown through the perspective of all of these, these characters' phones, etc. They are live streaming this. It also cuts to them like on their phones texting and uh, having like a Skype calls. It definitely pokes fun at the whole concept of social media influencers in how a lot of these people think that they are uh, the greatest people on earth. <laughs> You definitely get, especially with this guy, Chad, you get that stereotypical uh, kind of in your face, always screaming at the camera, influencer type person. And of course, they're doing all of this for views, for views, more views, more views. And one of the funnier parts of the movie is this because as they're streaming, you're getting the comments, right? And so if you actually are paying attention to these comments a lot, it's they're actually sometimes pretty funny. And they're really realistic, like what you would see in any comment section on a TikTok or YouTube video. Like these people are being attacked by this masked assailant and people are like, uh-oh, hashtag Chad gets the ax. Or like laughing at these people who are dying or getting hurt. And that's the sad truth is that that's probably what would happen in real life. So that's definitely an aspect of the movie that I, I appreciated as someone who's been doing social media like for a few years now. I enjoyed that aspect of it. As a horror movie, I mean, I, it's very really difficult to scare me. I did not get scared in this movie whatsoever. And it really just kind of recycles the same horror movie tropes that we see all the time. And so a lot of it's really predictable. But at the same time, I thought it was entertaining enough. I really put this on as like, just sort of the have on in the background as I would have played on my phone. And I was paying attention to it more than I thought I would. And so, yeah, I mean, I thought it was, it was, it was fun, it was entertaining. It's also stupid. <laughs> I thought the characters were really realistic in terms of social media influencers. So I don't know, I would, it's like, it's, I'm very torn on it. Like, obviously it's not a great movie, but also it really wasn't horrible. It was just, eh, I'll watch it once and that's it. Entertaining enough to kind of keep me focused on it for, you know, the hour and whatever minute long minutes it was. So out of a possible 2,643.7 bloody axes, I will give it, Mm, 900 eggplant dick emojis. So, there you go. Tis the season to get an axe in your fucking face from a crazy deranged Santa Claus. La 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 la. So, this was a thing. This, this certainly exists in the timeline of which we are living. Christmas, bloody Christmas. Here's another Mikey at the movie review thing, okay? 
This is so stupid. <laughs> so what's it about, Mike? Well, it's about um, an animatronic Santa Claus thing that was being, I guess, mass marketed, but oops, there's a product recall. I wonder why. And so one of these crazy animatronic Santa Clauses, I guess, becomes sentient. They don't really ever explain. And he wields an axe, and he just escapes the toy store and just starts fucking killing people. Uh-huh. That's about it. Yup. And he's got laser eyes. Of course. You know, that old traditional Santa Claus thing. Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. Santa's gonna shoot lasers into your fucking face and blow your head up. Or something along those lines. I don't know. <laughs> you know what? It's... Mm-hmm. I'll say this, the co-leads in this movie, they're actually kind of likable. Um, I, you know, I, I like her. She was, you know, she was great. Except the first like 30 some odd minutes of this movie is just these two going back and forth, just yippy yapping And it's just like, they're having just, they're just goofing around. They're like, oh my God, are they gonna have sex or not? Uh. They say the word fuck like every two fucking seconds. Like I just did. It's like an episode of like Gilmore Girls on crack and also rated R. I'm just like, get to the fucking killing already, Santa. And so it just becomes um, a Christmas movie slasher. Pretty, pretty brutal. Um, I will warn you, uh, spoiler alert. There is also a child in this movie who also is brutally murdered on camera. That whole, you know, unwritten rule of, hey, don't fucking kill kids in slasher movies. Well, they don't, they didn't listen. The animatronic Santa Claus is just played by a normal actor. It's pretty obvious. They didn't even really attempt to make him look like an animatronic. The um, effects when people are getting an axe to their face, you can tell immediately that it's like some sort of like fake, like clay mold of a person's head. Like it's like he hits the axe and oh, that's, that's just a dummy, obviously. Again, didn't even try, probably had a very low budget. This movie was fucking stupid. Entertaining? Sure, yeah, I'll give you that. It's different. So out of a possible 12,000 ho-ho-hos, I give it 226 bitches and ho-ho-hos getting an axe in their faces. So, there you go. Here's another one of Mike's favorite TV shows. Yeah, Community. And I know that there are a lot of Community fans uh, who follow me. In my opinion, this is the best half-hour comedy of all time. And I know a lot of people will disagree, but I love this show. So the show started off with the character Jeff Winger, played by Joel McHale, and he attends Greendale Community College, and he is taking several classes, including a Spanish class. And he pretends that he is running a Spanish study group just so he can get in the pants of Britta. And that's kind of how the premise of the show really started. It's a lot like how Cougar Town started with like a premise of like, meh. But then it kind of threw away that premise and just turned into something else. That's exactly what Community did, and it did it so fucking well. So Community turned into a show where this group of friends basically gets into hijinks every week, and they're doing off-the-wall silly shit. And they kind of eventually became this show where they would do themed episodes. And that is where they truly excelled. The coup de grace of all of them were the paintball episodes, where the entire college is playing a massive game of paintball. But it's like done like a serious action movie. And it's just, it's classic. They also do a Western-themed one later on. And of course, there was the Pillow and Blanket Fort episode. Troy and Abed create two different forts, one made of pillows, one made of blankets. And it's like, it's like a war breaks out. And they have this narration of one of those, like, old-timey Civil War documentaries doing the narration of this. Then they did a The Floor is Lava episode. And these are all done in serious ways. Well, I mean, they're funny, but the way they depict these, you know, stories is as if they're, like, actually doing, like, an action movie. They did an episode where they were all, like, first-gen video game characters. The Dungeons & Dragons episode is a classic. The Christmas Claymation episode. They did a Law & Order one about who destroyed some science project. They had classic Halloween ones. <laughs> I can love Troy and Abed. Troy and Abed in the morning. Best TV duo ever, in my opinion. Funniest, at least. Or there was one where they are all in the loony bin. <laughs> one of my favorites, the dice episode. Basically, this was when they would, they would roll a dice deciding who would go get the pizza. And each time it created a different timeline. It's fucking genius. This was one of my absolute favorite ones. It was the bottle episode. It was so well done. And then, of course, there is the six seasons and a movie. If you've ever heard that phrase, it comes from community. 
It was like a joke that I think Abed made in one of the earlier seasons about how a show, if it goes six seasons, it gets a movie. And so then fans of the show became, okay, we need to get to six seasons so we get a community movie. And for the longest time, that was like never going to happen. The show was like canceled, but then it got revived. The final season was on some random thing, some random platform. But we got that six season. And now they are making a community movie. It's going to be on Peacock. And it does have the original cast, including Donald Glover, which I was happy to hear. I don't know if they're going to have Chevy Chase, though. There was a lot of Chevy Chase drama on the show. He played the character of Piers, and he wasn't well-liked. It was funny. It was silly. It was goofy. The themed episodes were just so good. The cast, fantastic. So if you're ever, like, bored and like, I need to watch something, I want to watch something funny... Community is something I would recommend. I believe you can currently stream them all on Peacock. And you'd have to pay for it if you wanted to see it anywhere else, I think. Check it out. If you never have, you should watch it. It's fantastic. So this movie was f wild. Welcome to another Mikey at the Movies reviewing the movie Deadstream. I had never really heard about this movie before, but someone had mentioned it in one of my recent videos in the comments. I think it was under the Chad Gets the Axe review. So I said, meh, I'll look it up. And then I just watched it. So, it's from 2022. It's an hour and 27 minutes long. And it's labeled a horror movie. I would disagree, kind of. Uh, I did get a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. 76% from the fans. So, very positive reviews. What's it about? After a public controversy left him disgraced and demonetized, a washed-up internet personality tries to win back his followers by live-streaming himself spending one night alone in a haunted house. When he accidentally pisses off a vengeful spirit, his comeback event becomes a real-time fight for his life and social relevance as he faces off with a sinister spirit of the house and her own powerful following. So, this was, to me, more of a comedy than it was a horror movie. And much like with Chad Gets the Axe, a movie that I found to be, you know, entertaining, not a movie I'd watch again. This kind of has the same mentality. Social media influencer and acting like an actual, genuine, real-life social media influencer. Constantly looking at the camera, screaming at the camera in a really high-pitched kind of voice, saying, guys, 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 what should I do, guys? You know? <laughs> But because he is such a comedic type person, anytime there's like scares in the movie, to me personally, and maybe others will disagree, it was not remotely scary. I mean, there are some freaky looking visuals in this movie, but it was really difficult to be like, oh my God, that's scary. But I don't think it was really trying to be scary. I don't think, this was not a movie that was like taking itself seriously as a horror film. And honestly, for that reason, I fucking loved it. I did. I thought this was a really, really fantastic movie. It was insane. It was wild. I mean, it just kept escalating and escalating. And every time this guy would scream, he sounds like me if I would scream in a situation like this, and I would just laugh. I laughed many times throughout this movie. And I think in this case, it was intentional to get the audience to laugh. It looked like all of the effects and like the, the you know, the ghosts and stuff. It looks like all of them were done practically and not with like computers or anything. It's kind of hard to say if the character is actually likable really, but he's at least very entertaining. And again, he has a very realistic portrayal of a big giant social media person. I think my only gripe was that if this was supposed to be a horror movie, I don't know if it did that truly successfully. Even though it was, you know, dark and there were ghosts and, you know, blood and gore and stuff, there was like a lightness to it. Like, how do I describe it? The comedy was so kind of over the top that it detracts away from any potential horror, at least for me. It could be different for you, but that didn't bother me because it's still made for a really freaking entertaining movie. One I enjoyed and I probably would watch again. So I saw it through Amazon Prime through the Shudder thing. Then you get to pay for Shudder. But if you have it, I think it's worth a watch. It's a fun movie. It really is. It's not a fantastic, great, amazing movie. It's just fun. So out of a possible 6,666 demon eyeballs, I give it 8 million Ouija boards. So there you go. Do you remember when there was a giant PP on the cover of Little Mermaid? Uh, uh, hello, by the way. So us millennials will probably remember that there was controversy in a couple uh, Disney movies where there appeared to be some hidden messages or hidden images. One of the most profound ones was the cover of The Little Mermaid. In the background, you see, uh, you know, the castle and complete with many different spires. But if you look closely at one in particular, this one right there, this is a cartoon image and it is not a PP. Okay, TikTok. So what was the deal with this? Let's zoom out now. <laughs> so the rumor was, it was that it was drawn by a disgruntled Disney worker who was about to be laid off after the production of The Little Mermaid was done. And so to spite them, he drew a pee-pee. But according to, let's say, Snopes.com, 
the individual who drew the artwork for the cover of Little Mermaid was not actually a Disney employee at all. The excuse they gave was that they were rushed to draw this artwork, and the phallic image that you see was simply an accident, coincidence. It just looked that way, citing that other ones kind of had some similar appearances. God, that one is just so profound. So apparently it's a debunked rumor. They did end up removing that image and changing it for a future copies of the movie. What about the Lion King? Well, there was the infamous SEX written in the sky in leaves. When Simba collapses on the cliff, he pushes leaves out and they swirl about. And at one point it spells S-E-X. What about this? Is this true? Well, actually, yes, it is. Sort of. The individuals actually admitted that that does spell out something, that they put that in there on purpose. However, it does not spell, according to them, S-E-X. It instead spells S-F-X for special effects. Mm-hmm. Sure. Let's also quickly talk about how people have pointed out that the cover of The Lion King looks a little strange. Hey, baby. I'm not even, I'm gay. What am I even talking about? Also, let's quickly look at this cover of Mickey Mouse, some Mickey Mouse movie. Mm, when you see it, you see it. Don't move, all right? Don't move. A muscle. So don't, oh, hello, ma'am. How are you? All right, you're being lazy today. That's fine. Anyway, I guess I'll do this without you. Uh, don't Move is a movie that was on Netflix that premiered on October 25th, 2024. And here is my synopsis slash review, I guess. Don't Move follows a woman named Iris played by Kelsey... Asbiel? When one morning on a normal hike, she encounters a strange man, they have a conversation, they go their separate ways, and then, well, he finds her. The man... Oh, sorry. Uh, the man is played by Finn Whitrock, and side note, if God is in fact real, I would like to thank him personally for creating this specimen, so. He's 40 years old? Jesus. I look like I'm 25 years older than him, and I'm a year younger. Ugh. Anyway, it turns out this guy she meets is actually a serial killer. And so hijinks ensue. And by hijinks, I mean he injects her with a paralytic agent that causes her body to slowly shut down over the course of about 20 to 30 minutes. So it's race against time for her to get away from this guy, even though her body is slowly shutting down. Because eventually her body will completely shut down. She won't be able to move a muscle or talk a muscle or blink a muscle. No, I think she can blink. And she does manage to get away and she slowly begins to lose her motor functions. She manages to hide. Girl, really? He's going to see you. I mean, you're not even trying. Look at her down there. This reminds me of the scene, you know, the Hobbits did in the Fellowship of the Ring when they hid from the Wraiths, and they didn't, they didn't... Dude, how do you not see her? She's literally right there. So basically, it's a game of cat and mouse. He's chasing her, she's trying to get away from him, and that's pretty much what it is. It got a 74% by critics on the Rotten Tomatoes, which, not many reviews, though, but 38% of audience members did not like it so much. The movie is rated R, it runs about an hour and 32 minutes, and again, it's on Netflix. Um, I thought it was okay. I, you know, it's a decent movie. I, I like the premise. I like the idea of it. I like these movies that have like, you know, with the don't in the title, like don't breathe, don't move. The concept is really interesting. But at the same time, it's like, how much can you really do with this? I mean, she can't call for help. She can't move after a while. This is a movie that probably could have benefited from like that whole real time illusion sometimes you see in movies. Like the second he injects her, like the movie goes over the exact same time frame as it actually is occurring, but it doesn't do that. I mean, even an hour and 32 minutes felt a little too long for this. Like I didn't personally feel the suspense from it, but I think ultimately it just kind of becomes predictable. So it's like, it's a good concept. I enjoy the concept. I liked the, the movie, but it was a very, just like a flat liking of it. You know, like it's not like, eh, I wouldn't watch it again. Despite having, you know, little dialogue, she is really fantastic at pulling off this role. And as we've seen from American Horror Story, he is very good at playing creepy and evil. Is it worth a watch? Sure, if you're bored. If you don't see it, are you missing anything? Not really. So on my scale, out of a possible 822 um, hypodermic needles, I give it maybe 62 snail shells. So, that makes sense, right? Yeah? Okay. I finally got around to watching Dune 2. Did you too watch Dune 2? With your boo? While in the loo? No. Hi, welcome to another Mikey at the Movies. Here is my review of Dune Part 2. So I just want to say first that the visuals are beautiful, breathtaking, gorgeous, stunning. And that's just Timothy Chalamet. No, but the visuals in this movie are absolutely bonkers gorgeous. But I swear, like, every scene in this movie is absolutely breathtaking. The first movie was phenomenal and a visual tour de force. And this one is just even fucking better. 
So I guess real quick, uh, it's two hours and 46 minutes long. Yeah, it's a long one. Rated PG-13. You can actually currently stream it on Max if you have Max HBO. It got 92% on Rotten Tomatoes by the critics, 95% from the moviegoers. Doom Part 2 will explore the mythic journey of Paul, I can't say his name, as he unites with Chani and the Fremen while on a warpath of revenge against the conspirators who destroyed his family. Facing a choice between the love of his life and the fate of the known universe, he endeavors to prevent a terrible future only he can foresee. I'm not so good with the names. Obviously, it's got Timmy Shalshals, Zendaya, who's very somber but delightful. Josh Brolin, Jay Bautista, I'm Christopher Wacken, the emperor of this whole place. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was so bad. And it's got Austin Butler. Do you think he also walked around after this movie uh, was still stuck in his voice from the movie he did? I don't think I'll be nominated for an Oscar for this movie, but I had a great time filming this movie. You know, like he did with Elvis. Anyway, he's good at being creepy, I guess. The big old worms snake things are back. Like, I am still amazed this very day that they can do this shit, right? And how good it looks, how realistic it looks. It's got fantastic action sequences. It's got fights, duels to the death. It's got a pretty rich and deep story. Definitely tackles themes like, you know, having power, politics, the control of people, religion. And it does end, like, with, you know, a kind of a cliffhanger because they are making uh, Doom Part 3. I think it's called Messiah. Um, but Timothy Chalamet, I mean, all jokes aside, he does it wonderfully. He is a really legitimately good actor. Uh, yeah, this was a visual masterpiece, I mean, through and through. It's one of the most mesmerizing movies you will probably see. It's got a really great balance of story, action, the visual effects are out of this world. <laughs> Literally, you know, you're going to have to dump out your shoes afterwards, get all that sand out, but it's worth it. The first Dune got, I think, 10 Oscar nominations, including Best Picture. And it won six of those Oscars, which were all like the visual awards. But honestly, I think this movie was even better than the first. And so I could see this racking up a whole bunch of accolades just as much as the first one did. So out of a possible 50 sandworms, I give this movie 48 peaches. Uh, uh, okay. What's a TV show you're embarrassed to tell people you love? I'll go first. Cougar Town, and I'm tired of Heidi who I am. Yeah. Cougar Town, okay? That, it's, out, it's out there now. I am a cougar lover. Well, no. But yes, but no. You know what I mean. I think a lot of people were put off on this show because of the initial premise. So, you know, Courtney Cox plays this cougar-type character, recently divorced, single mom, who's trying to uh, get with younger dudes. You know, being a cougar. And yeah, at first it was like, eh, it's okay. But then slowly the show turned into something completely different. It was no, they completely disregarded that entire cougar premise. And for the, the rest of the show, after season one, they would have these little in-jokes in the title. They would say, yeah, still Cougar Town. Badly titled Cougar Town. Not what the show is, Cougar Town. 100% cougar free. Modern Cougar Town, you know, to play on Modern Family. It's okay to watch a show called Cougar Town. Regretfully, we give you Cougar Town. All they want for Christmas is a new title. <laughs> they did this one time. Up, oh, still Cougar Town. These are like actually on the show. Sorry, we still cringe at the title. <laughs> this is not the Simpsons chalkboard bit. <laughs> yeah, it's still called Cougar Town. We're not happy about it either. Titles we liked better. Hey, your name isn't that great either. <laughs> no, it's not just Scrubs in Florida with a lot of wine. Yeah, the show was made by the same people who did Scrubs, so if that helps you at all, there you go. And they did have a lot of the actors from Scrubs kind of make guest appearances as well. She was actually on the show. But ultimately, what it came to be was just a show about a group of friends doing hijinks. No, not friends, even though it has Courtney Cox. They all live in the same little cul-de-sac in Florida, and they just do a bunch of funny shit. Get into funny situations. And one of the running gags is how they're always drinking wine. And you have Courtney Cox, who's like obsessed with wine in the show. And you have these little gags like that. Or you have, what did she name him? Carl or something like that? Big Carl? Her wine glasses just kept getting bigger and bigger and more obnoxious. But after you get over the hurdle of that first season, and really kind of more of like the first half of the first season, you actually get a genuinely funny fucking show. I'm personally glad I stuck around and didn't ditch it after episode one or two. It definitely grew a cult following, but it never had strong enough numbers because of how the show initially began. And people just didn't want to get on board with it after that. But it did last like, I think five seasons. And eventually it moved to TBS where they could cuss. 
kind of. But it's just a bunch of likable, funny characters. Bobby and Andy, a great little duo. Penny Can! Uh-huh. I know you can watch the entire show, I think, still on Hulu. I know that because I recently rewatched it. <laughs> but yeah, it's just a, it, it becomes a funny sitcom about a group of friends doing funny things. It's just funny. Check it out if you dare. So I'm scared. Am I gonna die? I'm at an ENT appointment, never been to one. What is this? What is this? Is this a torture device? What is gonna be happening to me? Where does that go? What part of me does that go in? Why is there a fancy bowl? Did my doctor refer me to a torture chamber? Uh, nice knowing you guys, I guess. Who's this guy? How's it going? Is the fish and giant fuzzball supposed to make me feel happier, better, or what? Does that go in me? I don't want that to go in me. Update. I died. Mike, are you wearing a button shirt under a button shirt? I am. I am. So I have a growth uh, on my upper teeth right there. See? Yeah. That's why I was there. Everything should be okay, though. Here's another, another look, another angle. See that? Yeah. Turns out my false teeth are causing irritation on my gums. So I got tortured for nothing. 10 out of 10, though. Would recommend. Stitch this or comment below. Who is your favorite horror movie villain? Here's mine, and he's recent. Art the Clown, baby. Gotta love this guy. So I think Art first appeared in a short film. But the first time I ever saw this character was in the movie All Hallows Eve. But then the movie Terrifier came out, and then Terrifier 2, and then now there's Terrifier 3, which came out this year in theaters. But I have not seen this one yet, but I'm really excited to see it. Art the Clown, and the reason why I love him so much is because he is equal parts terrifying and absolutely bonkers hilarious. That if I saw this guy in real life, and he was as goofy and silly as he is, he would be the most terrifying real-life monster killer out there ever. <laughs> Look at his stupid smile. He's like Mr. Bean if Mr. Bean was a serial killer. Art doesn't have any dialogue ever. I'll get it. I haven't seen the third one. Maybe he talks in that one. I don't know. But this is pure mime work, essentially. He's played by an actor named David Howard Thornton. And the dude's a genius. I mean, he is so good at this. He is so good at, like, terrifying the living shit out of you, but also just making you laugh out loud. So here's a clip from the, the Halloween store clip from the second movie. I mean, he has scenes like this, where this is a scene, spoiler alert, a scene from the second movie where he absolutely just, like, Jack the ripper this poor girl, like, ten times over. I mean, just annihilated this person. And the character's mom walks in the room and Arthur Clown is like, oh, oh. <laughs> He's just like, do -do 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 -do. <laughs> Jesus, God, this is him in the third movie again. I haven't seen it, but no thank you. I would never want to see this in real life. I mean, it's like slapstick comedy meets gory, gory horror. These movies, by the way, are not for the faint of heart. They are extremely bloody. Very, very violent movie. Do not let your kids watch this. You know what's something interesting on TikTok? You cannot use the hashtag Art the Clown. It flags it and it removes it from your video. So you have to use like different variations of Art the Clown as hashtags. It's weird. And finally, I want to say, so like in the first Terrifier movie, um, Art, from what I understand, Art is a fully human person. It never really established what he is. But like by the second movie, it's clear that he is something supernatural. But I think in the first movie, he was just a guy. A normal dude dressed like this going around murdering people brutally. And I had to say, that's actually more terrifying if they left him that way than if than him being like a supernatural entity. Because it makes it more real and more like, that just it would add an extra layer of like horrifying to it. But I mean, regardless, it's still fantastic, even the second movie. I know you can watch the Terrifier movies on Amazon Prime. That's how I saw All Hallows Eve and the first two Terrifiers. Terrifier 3 is probably going to be on Amazon Prime at some point soon. I don't remember if I had to pay for them or not, though. I can't remember. Anyway, this is my favorite horror movie villain. Honorable mentions, probably Freddy Krueger, because for the same reasons. Scary, but also really funny. Same thing, Chucky would probably be number three. Scary, but funny. I like scary, but funny movie horror villains. Villain horror villains. I can't sp spoke. Anyway, what's yours? Stitch this and tell us what's one of your favorite movie endings of all time. Make sure you give spoiler alerts. Anyway, here's mine. And I already know that mine is controversial. Why do I know that? Because when this came out, uh, it had very polarizing responses in terms of the ending. It is the ending of The Mist. 
even set as a masterpiece, one of the most shocking movie endings ever. Uh-huh. <laughs> and from what I understand, Frank Darabont changed Stephen King's original ending from the book. And Stephen King praised him for his new ending. If you've never seen The Mist, it is a horror movie. It takes place in Maine when a storm rolls in that brings a thick fog and they soon quickly realize that in the fog are horrifying monsters and creatures. And most of the setting takes place in a grocery store where the characters are trapped by the mist. And it's not only the monsters they have to worry about, it's the people inside, especially the crazy ass religious nut lady. But here is the spoiler alert, so you are warned. So in the end, five characters escape from the grocery store. There's still people alive in the grocery store, but they want to go get help and get away. Well, they get caught in the mist when their car runs out of gas. They're surrounded by the mist, which means that the monsters are probably right there. Now, he has a gun, but unfortunately, he only has four bullets, and there are five people in the car. And being killed by these monsters, from what they've seen, is horrific, it's painful, it's, it's awful. So in order to not have that horrifying death, they collectively decide that the main character will shoot each of them dead. So that it's quick and painless. Including his own child. And then he says he'll figure out a way to end his own life because there won't be enough bullets for all of them. And he does it. He kills the four people in the car. Then he gets out of the car, screaming at the monsters to come get him. He's ready, come get me. When slowly but surely, out of the mist comes the military. They came to save the day. The monsters are defeated. They're gone. But he just shot four people dead, including his own child. Literally 30 seconds before the military rolls down the road. And that's how it ends. It ends with him screaming his head off. He just killed his kid for no reason. So obviously what happens in the ending isn't good, it's awful. But the reason why this is one of my favorite movie endings is because of how fucking shocking it was. I have never seen an ending like this before. You know, I've seen twist endings, right? We've all seen movies like The Sixth Sense, The Usual Suspects, have these really great twist endings that flip the whole story up on its end. But this one was just fucking shocking. You're like, God, if he had just waited 30, 45 seconds, all of them would have been fine. But how was he to know, right? This is actually one of my favorite horror movies. It's just so well done. Marcia Gay Harden, who plays the religious nut job, she is brilliant. And this ending is just brilliant. Okay, but what was supposed to happen? It says flying golf cart parade gone wrong. What was supposed to go right with this? What What are they waiting to see happen? I don't even need to check. I don't need to verify or look it up or anything. Uh, this was Florida. In your opinion, who was the funniest TV character of all time? One that can stand the test of time. I'll go first and I'm gonna cheat since it's my thing. I'm gonna give you two. Here's number one. So that is Rowan Atkinson as the timeless Mr. Bean. Oh, there he is with Teddy. I know people from my age group, especially, you know, millennials, will have a very fond memory of Mr. Bean. Mr. Bean was a British sitcom. I think it only had like 14 or 15 total episodes. And then there was two Mr. Bean movies. But for the most part, Mr. Bean was a character that never really spoke any dialogue. And Rowan Atkinson displayed his incredible abilities for physical comedy. He is the most likable, unlikable person of all time. This guy is always creating havoc and just doing the most off the wall shit to like get something for himself. I don't think anyone, like now as an adult rewatching it, I'm like, this guy was a dick. <laughs> But he was just always getting into hijinks and always coming up with these weird MacGyver things. And I think you can watch all of the Mr. Bean episodes, I'm pretty sure on YouTube, because that's where I rewatched him recently. But if you've never seen Mr. Bean, you should absolutely watch him. And, and introduce Mr. Bean to your kids, because he was definitely, you know, we all watched him as kids. And he was hilarious to us. So who's my number two? Very close, tied for number one. You got to be kidding me. Come here and kiss my ass. I don't want to kiss your ass unless there's money involved. <laughs> give me a break. Give me a break. You give me a break. You stop it. 
and you hear me out. You hear when I say and speak to you. you I'm out I'm out. To those unfamiliar, that is Jiminy Glick, played by Mr. Martin Short, right there. I'm sure a lot of you uh, current generation know him from Only Murders in the Building. Yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> So I first saw him on the show Primetime Glick, which is where he would interview celebrities, you know, like any other late night show, but it was only a 30 minute show. But the whole thing is, is that Jiminy Glick is this bumbling idiot who thinks he knows all with, you know, to do with entertainment and whatnot. But as a matter of fact, he knows shit. <laughs> He never knows who the guests are, who he's talking to. He always, he always says, he's always like browbeating them, making fun of them. He interviewed Ice Cube one time and called him Vanilla Ice. And he's also uh, another physical comedy type person. I and mean, this is obviously, you know, a fat suit that he's in, a lot of makeup. And when he like jumps up into his seat and tucks his leg underneath his, his, his butt, uh, it's just hilarious. And then of course, when he shoves full donuts in his mouth or throws like a bunch of candies at his face, every interview this man did as this character was just so funny. If you are someone who needs just a good laugh, maybe you're feeling down, Jiminy Glick is one of my go-tos. I have rewatched all of his interviews on YouTube probably a hundred times a piece. I'm not even kidding. Jiminy Glick is just sort of my go to uh, comedy therapy. And same thing with Mr. Bean. I know, you know, in the years since, there's been a lot of great comedic characters, a lot of great comedy shows, but I always go back to the classics. And these two, these two dudes right here, these are some of the best. He actually has done recent stuff too, by the way. If you YouTube him, Jiminy Glick, he has more, uh, more stuff, which is all, of course, hilarious. So yeah, those are mine. HBO confirms Game of Thrones movie in the works. It's very early in the process. And are we supposed to trust the process on this one, HBO? We all know. We all remember. You think we forgot how that shit ended? And what, you want to redo now? You want to say oopsie poopsies? Now, based on the articles I've read about this, they're basically stating that it's more of like an idea right now. We haven't really moved super forward with this just yet. They want to see a script first and go, okay, we can do this. Or say, no. Here's something that maybe they can do. And if the makers of Game of Thrones are watching this, they're not, but maybe. There's opportunities, right? You can say the things that happened in that final season, at least definitely in that final, like, two episodes. You can say, oh, <laughs> that was just a vision. You know, the whole three-eyed raven thing. Maybe uh, Daenerys was just taking a really long nap. And all of this was a dream, maybe a prophecy, right? You can use that, that lore, right? She prophesized about her own downfall. And then she can take that and go, <laughs> I'm not doing that. So there, there is, there is, there are chances that they can maybe erase what they did, but it has to really work perfectly for us to be like, okay, okay. But most importantly, I want you to make a movie and say, oops, that, no, that shit didn't happen, so that Cersei could get brutally murdered by someone. I would prefer Arya Stark to kill her, okay? I don't want rocks to kill her and fall on her head. I need you to erase the timeline and have someone just destroy that woman, Cersei. We all feel it, okay? We were all very angry that she died in such a bitch way. Spoiler alert, by the way. Oops. And maybe, just maybe, let's have someone on the Iron Throne who we thought the whole time would have been a possible candidate and not some random person's name you fucking threw out of a goddamn bag and said, mm, shit, okay, it's him. Because what did we watch the whole fucking show for? It was all about getting the Iron Throne. And you put someone on it who no one thought was even a possibility. Jesus! My anger's coming back. And another thing, you House of Dragon, because you're the same people, stop telling us war is coming for 800 seasons. Give us a goddamn war already. War is coming. We promise war is coming. <laughs> you know how we said war is coming? Well, it still is, but it's just taking a little bit longer than expected. Um, war might happen. We're just not 100% sure anymore. Yeah, war decided that it didn't want a war, so there's not going to be a war. Great. We watched 800 episodes to find out that. Okay. Anyway, you have opportunities to make this right, but you have to execute it perfectly. Looking forward to it! What would you do if this movie situation was real life? 
So, this is going to be in reference to the movie Gone Baby Gone. If you have not seen it, this video will contain massive spoilers, including ruining the ending of the movie. So, if you have not seen it and want to and don't want to be spoiled, don't watch this video. It came out in 2007, though, so odds are you either have already seen it or you don't want to. The movie, which is directed by Ben Affleck, stars his own brother, Casey Affleck, and Michelle Monaghan. They play private detectives who were hired by a family to help find a missing girl, a little child. The little girl was seemingly kidnapped out of her own bedroom in a Boston neighborhood. Her mother, played uh, incredibly by Amy Adams, who was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for this film. Well, her character is not so great. She is not a good mom. She is a drug addict, alcoholic. She leaves her kid unattended all the time. She exposes her young girl to drug dealers. She's not a very fit mother, but you do get the sense that with all of that, she does still very much love her little girl. You also have police detectives investigating this case, one of them played by Ed Harris, and the chief of police played by Morgan Freeman. Never do that again, Mike. That was terrible. Morgan Freeman's character, Ed Harris's character, are basically telling Casey Affleck and his girlfriend, you know, you don't really have a chance. It's been more than 76 hours. She's, the little girl's probably gone. But he is still determined to find her. So Casey Affleck's investigation takes him around Boston, where there is a, a known child predator. There is a gang member that, you know, possibly these people may have been involved in this disappearance. Was it child trafficking? He's just trying to figure it out. And then the end comes. And again, major, major spoilers. It turns out the entire time, the little girl was with Morgan Freeman's character. He, along with, I believe, the Ed Harris character and the little girl's uncle, played by the guy who plays Bosch, they organize this kidnapping to get the little girl away from her negligent, terrible mom in order to give the little girl a much better life. Casey Affleck finds this all out in the end, and he has a decision to make. Do I say nothing and let the little girl stay with this guy who is being raised in a wonderful home, being well taken care of? Or do we do the right thing and give her back to her mom? Casey Affleck's character makes a decision to give the little girl back to her mother. And Morgan Freeman and the others are arrested for the kidnapping. I know when this movie came out, this truly divided a lot of people, especially people who weren't parents and people who are parents. I'm not a parent. But my gut tells me that I would have probably said, no, you can just keep her with Morgan Freeman. But is that the right thing to do? What do you guys think? Did he make the right decision? Comment below. All right, let's blind rank some horror movies, shall we? The Shining. Ooh, that is a fucking classic. I just don't know if there's going to be anything... Else, that'll be like, they'll top, I'll say three. Sorry to horror aficionados out there if you yell at me. The Purge. The first one or like the whole franchise? Well, I don't know. Uh, what if like The Purge fucking four comes up? Oh, sh I'm going to assume it means franchise, so eight. It's like they're, okay. I like them. Insidious. You know what? I might get hate for this. I don't really like the Insidious movies, but I'm going to say nine not a big fan. I'm like, meh, I've seen better. 1408. I don't really consider that a horror movie as more of like a visual mind fuck of a movie. 10. That wasn't scary to me. Eh. <laughs> okay, so it. <laughs> Again, are we doing franchise, the whole thing, including the, the, the Tim Curry one? Because if we... Uh, fuck, I don't know. Um... Six, six, six. Sinister. I like Sinister. It was a sort of unsettling movie. I don't know if I would put it in my top five, though. But I'm going to say seven. I hope Conjuring. That would not have been in my top five, but now I have no choice. I like The Conjuring. I like you, Conjuring, okay? We'll say five. We'll say five. We'll say five. Halloween. Again, the whole franchise, or which one of this is it? There's 600 of them. I'm going to pretend it's the original Halloween, and I'm going to go to number two. I'm pretending, okay? Because I don't know. Who the fuck is Veronica? Can I skip? No? Tits on a cross. Can I, can I stop it and then start it? No? Fuck. Okay. Well, fuck, Veronica. 
Four, I guess. I don't know who the fuck you are. This better be a good fucking good. The nun. The nun is who I waited for. The nun. Is who I rate. Bullshit. I'm not even going to hit number one. Nope. Fuck you. Go to hell. Nun. Go to hell. You, you hell bitch. Uh, I can't stop it. No, no. Fuck. Just so you guys know, I am rebelling. I am, I am January 6ing this bitch, all right? I'm protesting with force and tear gas and smoke grenades and shit. I'm not, I'm not putting this shit on my list. Bye, Felicia. Good readings, Felicia. I got really unhinged at the end. I do apologize, but fuck you, nun. Welcome to another Mikey at the Movies where I review the movie The Hunt. I swear I watch more than horror movies and slasher movies, I promise. I've just been on this weird kick lately. I don't get it. Anyway, what's it about? So first, it was released in 2020. It's an hour and 30 minutes long, and it's considered a mystery thriller. Sure. I would say more of like an action type movie. Twelve strangers wake up in a clearing. They don't know where they are or how they got there. In the shadow of a dark internet conspiracy theory, ruthless elitists gather at a remote location to hunt humans for sport. But their master plan is about to be derailed when one of the hunted, Crystal, turns the tables on her pursuers. It got borderline reviews from critics and uh, moviegoers. So yeah, essentially these are people who were just plucked out of their own lives and put into the situation where all of a sudden they're being hunted and shot at by people they don't know. They don't understand why they're there, why they were picked. But what these people did not account for was that one of these people was basically Lady Rambo. This chick's a badass. She ain't fucking around. She's like, you're gonna come after me? Well, I'm coming the fuck after you. And so really, it's just about her going around killing all of these attackers and hunters. It is a violent affair. It's uh, full of action. A lot of people getting shot. There is a lot of death, a lot of carnage. So I would say this movie has had relevance for sure when it came out in 2020. I didn't see it back then, I just saw it now. But there is a lot of relevance here in today's society, especially here in, in America. Because ultimately this is about uh, <laughs> conservatives really versus liberals. And I mean that quite literally. I mean, that's literally what this is. I don't want to spoil too much in case you do want to watch this. Um, I saw this on Amazon Prime. It, it basically takes both sides and makes them both like these caricatures. It, it's both are very portrayed very stereotypically. And honestly, I'm not really sure who was supposed to be considered the good guys and the bad guys. But the whole thing is organized and ran by Hilary Swank. There's this pretty epic fight sequence in the very end between these two ladies. I think as just sort of like a, a mindless action movie where it's like a one woman army type thing. I think as that alone, it works really well. It's a solid um, action sequences. You know, the, the star of the movie, she is fantastic. She is extremely uh, likable. But it definitely gets bogged down by them trying to inject this uh, topical uh, storyline where it's really difficult to take either side seriously at all. I think it would have worked better if they didn't try to put too much politics into it, if they just kind of more simplified it. So essentially for me, as um, an action style movie, I thought it was pretty solid, but as a overall type thing, I think they just tried doing too much and it took a little bit out of it just for me personally. So in the end, I would say it was a pretty average movie. So of course, with my typical normal rating, out of a possible 922 pigs, I give this 602 old people being shot at a gas station. So there you go. What the f was this movie? Welcome to another Mikey at the Movies and this time I'm reviewing in a violent nature, which came out this year, 2024. When a locket is removed from a collapsed fire tower in the woods that entombs the rotting corpse of Johnny, a vengeful spirit spurred by, on by a horrific 60-year-old crime, his body is resurrected and becomes hell-bent on retrieving it. A locket. The undead golem hones in on the group of vacationing teens responsible for a theft, the theft, and proceeds to methodically slaughter them one by one in his mission to get it back, along with anyone in his way. It's an hour and 34 minutes. Uh, it's definitely a horror movie. Uh, got 78% by the critics on Rotten Tomatoes. Fans seem to disagree. So I will say this, this is one of the most unique slasher movies that I've seen. Normally in slasher movies, you get the whole thing from the perspective of the would-be victims, right? And the killer kind of just is always there somewhere, you know, he's out there. But in this one, you really don't get much of anything about the actual eventual victims. What the movie does is it does these super long, perceived as one long shot, and they're uh, just following the killer from behind as he slowly sulks around this 
foresty area. It's also unique as there is no background musical score in this movie. It's all about the ambient noises. You hear his thump, thump, his footsteps with like the flies and, and buzzing around him because he's the undead. And spoiler alert, by the way, I mean, it's a slosh movie, how much can you spoil it? But this movie has the most inventive and horrific and goriest deaths I have ever seen. This man takes his little hook thing and he punches it through someone's stomach. The person turns around, he takes the, the hook, he slams it into their head. He then flips the person around and pulls the chain, which causes the person's head to snap and break down this way with their spine being removed. And then he pulls their head through the hole in the person's stomach. Good Lord. It is not for the faint of heart, not for kids. In the end, this is really just another Friday the 13th, Halloween, high school or college-aged kids at some sort of remote location, being stalked by a psychopath killer wearing a mask who's clearly a supernatural being. So it doesn't really offer anything new in terms of just like the overall slasher concept. But it does flip it a little bit by really only giving us the perspective of the killer and really paying no attention to the people. The lore behind this is him is like, eh, it's, you know, it's okay, it's... I, Nothing we haven't seen before. I didn't hate this movie. I didn't love this movie. But in the end, it's really no different than all the shit we've seen before. I think it's worth a one-time watch if you're really into this genre. I've always been really like, eh, about the slasher genre personally. So maybe that's why I didn't really like, really jump into this one and love it. But slasher fans may really enjoy this. So if you are one of those people, definitely check this one out. I watched it through Amazon Prime with the Shutter add-on. So out of a possible 246 hooks, I give it 106 human heads pulled through their own stomachs. So there you go. What Kermit the Frog is called in 10 different countries? Denmark, Kermit, France, Kermit, Romania, Kermit, Slovakia, Kermit, Italy, Kermit, Canada, Kermit, Iceland, Kermit, the Netherlands, Kermit, Poland, Kermit, Spain, Gustavo. <laughs> different <laughs> okay so jesus oh so this was an experience huh looks like a karen if she turned into a zombie right so here is my synopsis slash review of the horror serial killer movie the long legs starring is it micah monroe this actress right here and yeah nicholas cage this is Nicolas Cage, folks. Um, can we just give this movie the Oscar for best makeup now? Or because, yeesh. So let's see the real quick uh, description here. Long Legs is rated R. It's an hour and 41 minutes long. It's described as a horror film. It has an 86% on Rotten Tomatoes by critics, 61% of fans, meh. So, in pursuit of a serial killer, an FBI agent uncovers a series of occult clues that she must solve to end his terrifying killing spree. So basically, they kind of almost paint this guy as like a Zodiac killer type because this long legs person um, sends, you know, notes with coded messages. And the belief is that he is some kind of satanic killer. But the thing is, is there's no signs or clues or evidence that long legs himself ever enters the home. So how are these families dying? And so that's up to her and her FBI team to figure out. She gives a very subtle performance, but it's also, she's really good in this movie. She is. So if you're looking for Nicholas... God, Jesus. Oh, man. If you're looking for Nicolas Cage to be, like, throughout this entire movie, you will be disappointed. Much like Beetlejuice in the first Beetlejuice movie, how Michael Keaton was only in it for, like, 15, maybe 18 minutes, I would say Nicolas Cage has maybe a grand total of 10 to 15 minutes of screen time. But when this man is on screen, he is utterly horrifying. He is unrecognizable. And Nicolas Cage is definitely someone we all know for being very over the top with his performances for the most part. Sometimes it works. Like I thought it worked really well in a movie like Face Off. Sometimes it sucks. Like when he was in Wicker Man. Here, um, I personally think he was fucking fantastic. For the few minutes or so you really get him on screen and talking, he is incredibly convincing as an actual serial killer and he is nightmare inducing. It is such an uncomfortable experience. His performance is so, like, unnerving. And honestly, I think he had the perfect amount of screen time to be as captivating as he was. As a horror movie, I think it's good. As a true crime serial killer type story, I think it's maybe even better. 
it is a slow paced film, but in a case like this, the slow pace, it unwinds the story, I think, in a really, really good way. But if you're looking for like a horror movie with a scare every 10 minutes, you're not going to get that here. It's a very unnerving film, very dark atmosphere. But overall, I, just, I think it works. I think it works really well. But I don't know if we, if we didn't have this performance, I think only he could have done this, by the way, only him. I don't know if it would have been as good. I really think he elevated the whole thing. You can watch this now on Amazon Prime. You could buy it if you wanted to for like $19.99, I think. But right now it's on, I don't know if it's a sale or not, but you can rent it like I did for $5.99. Which for Amazon Prime for a new movie, that's cheap as shit. So my rating, out of a possible 666 long legs, I will give this movie 416 short fingers. So you obviously know what that means. Yeah. Oh, for f sakes. This is another Mikey at the Movies, reviewing the movie Mickey's Mousetrap. Uh, hour and 20 minutes long. Came out just this year. Apparently it's a horror movie. Debatable. Uh, I think they just misspelled the word horrible. Stuck working the late shift at the amusement park arcade, Alex receives a surprise visit from her friends on her 21st birthday. However, their night of fun soon turns into a fight for survival when a killer dressed as Mickey Mouse crashes the party. That is the actual premise for this movie. So once that whole copyright thing was done with like Disney things like Winnie the Pooh and Mickey Mouse, now people are taking those characters because they're allowed to use them now in any way, shape, or form they want to, including the form of what the f And so far they've just turned all these characters into murderous little shits, which actually could have, you could do really good things with this, but they haven't yet. This is the stupidest movie I may have ever seen in my entire 39 year existence. Everything about this is the worst thing I've ever seen. The acting, atrocious. I mean, we're talking worse than the happening levels of acting, okay? Burt Demick is Oscar caliber next to this pile of mouse shit. Mouse droppings, mouse peplets. I don't, I don't even know what they do. I, he, I, what, I don't even know what he is. Like, spoiler alert, there's just a guy uh, who apparently spills some water on, a, on an electrical cord and that turned him into a killer Mickey Mouse who can teleport? Except when he's in a certain type of light. What? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm trying. I don't know. I just want to go home. I just, want, I just don't want to be here anymore. I'm so sorry, Steamboat Willie. We have failed you. Like the only way this movie could be enjoyable is if Rift Tracks does this movie. Rift Tracks, if you see this, you won't. Find a way to do this movie because that's it. That's the only way a person can watch this shit. This was literally the dumbest shit I have ever witnessed. My eyeballs needed to pop out of my head and go to therapy. I was blind for like a whole day because my eyeballs were gone. Oh, um, I don't even, that's it. I just, this is just so stupid. Oh, and it just ends, by the way. Just mid final scene, it just ends. I just abruptly, I think they ran out of money. The place they were filming in said, hey, we need to place back, you gotta go. The actors need to go back to their normal jobs. They ran, I, I don't know. It just ends, there's no conclusion. It's just pff, done, that's it. No resolution, nothing. The, the the survival of a couple people is just left up to you. Just ambiguous, just, uh, that is, they ran out of paper on their scripts. I don't know. Out of a possible 700, <laughs> I give it zero, zero. I give it negative zero hundred. So there you go. My life was turned into a biographical film in the nineties and I bet none of you could say the same. <laughs> Proof, <laughs> you got it. Proof is in the pudding, baby. 1992 film called, you guessed it, Mikey. <laughs> I don't want to brag, but I was not a good child. Anyway, what's it about? Well, bad things happen around a nice little boy who has a hammer, a slingshot, and a bow and arrow. So good that no critics have really seen it. <laughs> but the people sure have, and well, fuck them. They didn't like my life story. Bitch. Yeah, it's about me when I was a little boy going from foster family to foster family and killing them all. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm just kidding. This movie is not about me. So don't take anything I've said so far seriously because I know the internet is the internet. Okay, this is a fictional film about a little child named Mikey who just kills his families. He uh, bashes them in with uh, baseball bats, shoots them with bows and, bow, bow, bows and arrows, bow, bow and arrows, bow and arrows. Oh, this shit. And uh, look at, remember Jason and Freddy were kids once too, hmm? 
Yeah, he's basically a demon child without the demon part in him. He's just a child who acts like a uh, like a demon. I remember liking this movie when I was a kid because it had my name. Because everyone called me Mikey growing up, and well, they still do. And so I was like, <laughs> look how cool this is. There's a movie with my name on it, you know what I mean? Oh, it's about a kid who kills? It's totally not me. I don't know why I winked. Anyway, yeah, it's a pretty s stupid uh, movie. It's pretty bad. But it's one of those bad movies that you're like... I kind of enjoy watching this, you know? It's it's the one of those, a movie you love to dislike. Where can you watch it if you wanted to? Well, according to Rotten Tomatoes, it's on Peacock. I have not, I have not confirmed that, but if it says it, it probably is. But I actually watched it through Rift Tracks. Now I had to pay for this one because it's not on their uh, app that you pay five bucks a month for. So I saw this on Amazon Prime. If you just type in Rift Tracks Mikey, it's, I think it's under 10 bucks. I don't think it's very expensive. I can't remember what I paid for it, but it's funny. So if you want to watch the movie, but don't really want to watch the movie just because, you know, just the movie on its own, you can tune in to the Rift Tracks version where you just watch the movie and they talk over it and make fun of it, you know? Good times, great oldies. Good coyote. Is that a local thing? Yeah, I think it is. What am I doing? Oh yeah, he also really loves putting um, plugged in devices into things of water. He's kind of, he's kind of a chill guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, he's not, he's a fucking evil monster. Anyway, check it out. I just wanted to let you guys know about it, that it's, this is a movie that one time existed and it's not great, but it's fun. Funly stupid. Funly? Funly, Mike, really? God, I can just take a bat to someone's head right now, what? Hmm? Anyway, check it out, bye. All right, let's work out these neck muscles, shall we? Casablanca or Soul? I haven't seen Soul. Casablanca put me to sleep, but I guess I have to choose that one. Donnie Darko or Psycho? Oh, Psycho. The Prestige or Catch Me... Oh, I love The Prestige. That movie's so good. Usual Suspects or Bohemian Rhapsody. Those could not be the most further from the fucking each other. They're fucking each other? What was I trying to say? Um. Okay, Uh. Usual Suspects? Mark? Mark? Who the fuck is Mark? Castaway? I don't know what that is. Golden Compass or Blade Runner? Oh, Blade Runner. 100%. Black Panther or The Untouchables? Black Panther. Edward Scissorhands or Frozen? Fuck Frozen. Go freeze your ass off, bitch. Casablanca or Psycho? Psycho. Prestige or Usual Sus- Oh, Prestige. I love that movie so much. Castaway or Blade Runner? Blade Runner. Black Panther or Edward Scissorhands? Oh, uh, they're so vastly different. Black Panther. Psycho or The Prestige? Prestige. Sorry. Fuck off about it. Blade Runner or Black Panther? Oh. God, I, I love both of these for, like, completely different reasons. <sighs> Blade Runner. Prestige or Blade Runner? Prestige. You know what? That's... It checks out. Christopher Nolan movie on my list. There was no Quentin Tarantino movies on here, so... Christopher Nolan would have been the next guy. So, shut up, Mike. Okay. Let's talk about some funny movie and TV show cliches. Comment some cliches from movies and TV you like below. I always love this one. Just casually walking away from an explosion. You know, no biggie. Fucking category 6,000 explosion. I don't know if that's an actual measurement, but... And they're always like in slow motion like, Oh yeah, I did that. <laughs> Fucking debris and sharp shit and shrapnel everywhere. They don't get a goddamn scratch. Well, that is Wolverine, right? He would just heal anyway. Bad example. How about this one? Driving, but talking to the person and not looking at the road? I'm taking a huge gamble by having a conversation with you. We may crash into a semi-truck and die. Speaking of movie driving, what's with the fucking, what's doing this with the wheel? Like, what is that? What? I look like I'm double jerking someone, sorry. But like, they're driving in a straight, they're driving in a straight line, but they're like, oh, God, double jerking again, sorry. Can't resist. Like, how are they not fucking just swerving all over the place? It's fucking bouncing off of cars like a goddamn pinball machine. Hey, we just broke the window to break into this car. How would we ever get it to start, though? Oh, no worries. The keys are just under the visor. Because we all do that, right? We just leave our fucking car keys in the visor. Why not? Same thing when they leave a fucking key underneath, like, a pot outside your house. Like, bitch, what? This one... This one makes me vomit, almost. Characters in the emergency room, the hospital, they wake up from, like, a six-day coma. They're like, oh, I gotta get out of here. I gotta go save Rebecca. RIP! Rip! Just rip that shit right out of their arms. And the nurses are like, no, 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 you gotta stop. Please don't. Don't do it. I don't ever... I feel like fucking rip that shit out of my arm. Blood spraying everywhere like a Quentin Tarantino movie. It's just, it's just so... Ouch! <laughs> I love this. When uh, characters in movie and TV shows are typing something on a computer, we as the audience, we need to know what they're saying. 
Hello, Susan. I had a great time at dinner tonight. I hope we get to have dinner again. Uh, next time, we will not go to Taco Bell. I will take you somewhere fancier like Red Lobster. Like, you just show us the screen we can read. Or movie hackers doing this. All right. We're in. Bitch into what? They start saying shit like I gotta hack the mainframe with a zip stop boop beep bop machine and I gotta do the over flummox and I got to uh, access the uh, bread box device. And then the other character's like, <laughs> in English, please. We're in. How about when a character receives a present, like a birthday present or Christmas gift, they're like, <gasps> what is it? Um, <gasps> open it, bitch. The fuck am I gonna tell you for? That's why it's wrapped. Open it. The fuck you mean, what is it? You know what? It's, I'm taking it back. Movie character gets into a cab. Cab driver's like, all right, where are we going? Character's like, just take me home. Okay, well, where the fuck is home? We're not friends. I don't know you. CCTV in movies always looks crystal clear. You can zoom in. You can see every goddamn pore on their face. You can see, you can just, in movies, they can zoom into the reflections of their eyes and say, oh my God, I can see the killer in their eyes from this camera. Reality. I don't know. I think I see... Is that Barney? I'm not even sure. <laughs> Marty McFly did things before they were cool, after before they were cool. <laughs> People make fun of Sally Field's character, Mrs. Doubtfire, for not seeing through Robin Williams' ruse, but accusing your nanny of secretly being your ex-husband disguised as an elderly British woman is the sort of shot you don't take unless you're 100% certain. Yeah, pretty much. Hollywood logic, bad guys don't deserve a nose. Oh, that's... I never really realized that. None of the new Willy Wonka movies have understood that Gene Wilder's version of Wonka worked because you felt like there was a real chance he was just going to sit there and watch those kids die. <laughs> he was fucking evil. Just realized that Bob from Stranger Things is also Doug from 50 First Dates, and I don't know what to do with this information. Sam Gamgee did not help Frodo take the ring all the way to Mordor to destroy Sauron and save Middle Earth just to be recognized as Bob and Doug. Aw, poor Sam. Nine-year-old. Hey, Dad, I have a pun for you. Oh, what is it? Nine-year-old. It's like a joke where you play with words. I just got Leslie Nielsen by my own child. A hospital? What is it? It's the big building with patients. Huh? Remember? Yeah. How you do... <laughs> okay. Tell me what's on your mind. Who the fuck is that? Someone tell Johnny Downey Jr. he need to go put a shirt back on and finish Pirates of the Avengers 6 Infinity Pearls. <laughs> that's, that's so, who is that? Is that one of them or, uh... Oh, Elon Musk is at his shit again. Breaking, Tesla announces new cyber bus. <laughs> oh, I'd write it. I still can't believe that the entire Mr. Bean only consisted of 15 episodes. As a child, you'd swear you'd seen 10 seasons of the show. Yeah, it's, yeah. I remember when I went back to watch this as an adult. I was only able to find, you know, 14, 15 episodes. I'm like, where the fuck is the rest? And then I looked it up and realized there was only 15 episodes. I was like, what? I watched this show for years. That's because British shows, they do like seasons of like four episodes. I'm looking at you, Sherlock. Come back, Sherlock. You were hot. And also a great show. Me playing Call of Duty, wondering why there's no sound. <laughs> My grandfather with his new Bluetooth hearing aid. Aw, poor Gramps. Two occurrences of lunch cannot occur on the same day. The fuck you talking about? What about Elevensies? My favorite part of Star Wars was when Darth Vader lost his cool during a staff meeting and just started choking a co-worker. Ah, uh, if only it were legal. Once I became a parent, I finally understood the scene where Yoda gets so tired of answering Luke's questions and just dies. <laughs> you want a conspiracy theory? I'll give you a conspiracy theory. Get the mother fuck out of here. How... Dare you? But wait. So which one's the gay one? Him? Pippin? Pippin's gay? Man, yeah, I can see it. Oh, Kermy! I wonder what our kids will look like. Oh God! This. This is why abortion needs to be legalized throughout the entire country. That was amazing, Jason. I never heard such an accurate rendition of several cats getting run over by a lawnmower. Oh God, Ernie. Oh, hey Bert. Blindly ranking movies. You bet I've seen all of them. Oh, The Dark Knight. Starting out strong. Oh, God bless America. That's not Dark Knight Rises, is it, right? No, okay. Oh, God, is it going to be the best one? I'll say two for now. Well, I can't change it, so it's permanent. <laughs> Saving Private Ryan. You know, I'm not a big war movie guy. I liked it. It's a great movie. But I would say, put it at eight. 
I don't know. We'll go to another one. Oh, I love Toy Story, but not top five. Sorry, Toy Story. I'll say, we'll put you at nine. Ah, oh, okay. Goodfellas. Nope, that's the Godfather I just did there. I like Goodfellas. Um, maybe on popular opinion, didn't love it. I like it. Okay. I like you, Goodfellas. Like! Well, that's like ten. Let's see. Oh, the Godfather. Now I got... Oh, shit. I haven't seen part two. Can I... Can I make it go again? I don't want to put it on my list. I haven't seen it. Shit. Fuck. Seven. Ugh. Oh. Lucky number slobbing. Jurassic Park. Da, 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 da. Probably number five. Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. Other, uh, maybe unpopular opinion. Not a big Star Wars guy. Um, well, shit. You know what, Mike? This is your own fault. You did this. You did this. Titanic. Hmm. I don't think I would have put Titanic in my number top five, but now I have to because I'm an idiot. So four. I mean, I love it. Ratatouille. Oh, fuck, dude. I mean, that would not even been on my list. I like it. Okay, but I don't love it. Let's see. Number one. Definitely not, would not be Jaws. Um, fuck me twice on a Thursday afternoon while wearing a goddamn skirt and sucking a fart out of someone's twisty straw. Ugh. I don't like my list. The dog doesn't either. I have two irrational movie theater fears and I'm wondering if you guys can relate or what are your own? So, <laughs> these two things I've always had in my brain whenever I go into a movie theater that I'm petrified of occurring. So the first thing is like, if you're watching a movie and it's like a really uh, quiet scene, a somber moment, something. It's just, it's dead silent, right? My first fear is the, uh, <laughs> my stomach growling. Like, you know, just randomly happening, of course, during a quiet part of a movie. And like everyone in the theater can hear it because it just somehow, it just amplifies. It got to a point where if I would like know it was about to happen, I would do the old <laughs> thing. <laughs> to cover it up. And then my other irrational fear is in any movie, but especially a comedy, I am afraid of being the one and only person in the entire theater who laughs at something. Like it's just my laugh, nobody else laughs. So like either I was the only one to get the joke or I was the only one who thought it was funny, but actually it wasn't. And you have to do that like that, just like that, like, oh shit, <clears throat> it, was a, it was a cough, a laugh. <laughs> Can you guys relate? Can you guys understand? What are yours? Do you have any? I know it's a weird thing, but maybe you do. Yep, I am pretty much the exact same way. I, that's probably my number one fear uh, with going to a movie. Can you believe, by the way, that the Aurora movie theater shooting happened 12 years ago? 12 years ago. But yeah, I think that that whole moment hit a lot of people really hard. A movie theater is basically an enclosed space usually with exits that are only like towards the front. So like if someone were to come in there and go insane, it's gonna be really hard to get out. So I used to go to a movie in theaters literally every single weekend. It was like my thing, I did that. Sometimes I would see multiple movies over the course of a weekend. Sometimes I would see three or four movies in theaters the same day. That is how much I absolutely loved going to a movie theater to watch a movie. There was something so delightfully distracting about it. Like if, you know, mental health issues, it was just like this little two hour time frame where you can be like just completely lost in something else. But for me personally, and I know a lot of you guys are probably the same way, uh, I have a very paranoid brain. So once that happened, I haven't been to a movie theater since. I mean, I've been to one, I could probably count on one hand how many times I've been to a theater in the past 12 years. I went from seeing uh, literally like 100 movies a year to, in theaters to none, zero. And I hate that. In 2008, I saw 180 movies. I know that because I used to have a movie review blog uh, many, many years ago, and I, you know, had a tally. 180 to zero now. <laughs> My uh, best friend at the time and I, we had tickets to go see The Dark Knight Rises. We had already paid for them. And our 
the one we, the showing we were seeing was within 24 hours of the shooting happening. And I remember we had to stand in this really long line waiting for the actual theater to open for us to go inside of it. And all you could hear, I mean, just all around you were people like talking about that and how freaked out they were, how scary they were. Some people were talking about how they were looking at certain people like, why does that person have a backpack? Why does that person... You know, why is there a person's purse so big? You know, like all these paranoid things you would hear people talking about in line. And again, for me personally, I've only ever seen The Dark Knight Rises one time. That was the one time. But I was so mentally distracted the entire time watching it that I didn't even like the movie. Coming from someone who like The Dark Knight was one of my all-time favorite movies to the, the third one, Dark Knight Rises, just not liking it simply because I had a hard time paying attention. Can you guys remember back then, like... Because in that theater, we had an, there was two entrances slash exits. There were armed cops, like, outside of each exit. And every time someone got up and left the theater, I'm like, oh my god, are they coming back? I wish I can convince my brain to go back to the theaters, but I just, I can't do it. What about you guys? I know, I mean, obviously you. But does anyone else have that fear? Has anyone else not gone to a movie theater because of that? I hate it. <laughs> What's a movie you fully expected to hate, but ended up absolutely loving? Stitch this or comment below with your answer. But here's mine. Mad Max Fury Road. I, in terms of expectation versus reality, I have never been so unbelievably wrong in my entire fat existence. I don't know why I call myself fat there, but I did. I was being so stubborn, like refusing to watch this movie because I just thought for whatever reason, I don't know why, I thought it was gonna be really stupid. But then back when the movie first came out, this is, you know, when I watched it, I had saw that it got somewhere around a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes and a really high rating by normal moviegoers. So I was like, fine, I'll watch it. And when I turned it on, I was like, oh my God, it's gonna be the longest two hours of my life. Could not have been more wrong. My God. Mad, Mad Max Fury Road is one of the most beautiful, stunning, masterpieces of a film I've ever seen in my life. These two fat guy eyes has never seen something so like cinematically gorgeous. Is cinematically a word? It is now if it isn't. What's it about, Mike? Well, it's not about much. Came out in 2015, it's rated R, runs about two hours. In a post-apocalyptic wasteland, a woman rebels against a tyrannical ruler in search for her homeland with the aid of a group of female prisoners, a psychotic worshiper, and a drifter named Max. And it stars Charlize Theron as Furiosa and Tom Hardy as Max, Mad Max. It is not rich on story. It's not heavy on dialogue. Mad Max Fury Road is basically one gigantic two hour long car chase. And you might think, well, how exciting can that be after, you know, some time? It is. It fucking is. Th this, this is visually just, it melts your eyes. It is so good. It's fucking delicious, if, if that's even possible. The cinematography is unbelievable. The action is top notch. And a lot of this is not CGI visual effects. A lot of it is just genuinely practical effects. I mean, this is obviously visual effects, but the majority of it isn't. This is not a movie you go in expecting some like powerful message and story. This is really just a feast for your eyes. And sometimes that's all a movie needs to be. If you can pull it off successfully, like Mad Max does, you don't need a heavy story. You don't need a lot of character development. You just need it to be a visual gem. I mean, it's it was nominated for 10 Academy Awards, folks. It won six of them, but it was nominated for Best Picture and Best Director. That is how good this movie is. A movie like Mad Max, an action movie, a car chase movie, nominated for Best Picture and Director. That is how visually stunning and powerful this movie is. I never wanted to watch it, but now I've ended up watching it probably seven or eight times. I might watch it again today. Also, there is a sequel that came out this year, 2024, called Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. Um, also, a very, very good movie. Another visually stunning movie. It's got Chris Hemsworth and Anna Taylor-Joy. And while I loved it, it I was expecting to love it this time. And so it was just more like, I enjoyed it. It was fun. It was a good movie. But it wasn't like that, uh, I was expecting to hate it and then ended up being blown away by it, like Mad Max. So, still worth a watch. Absolutely watch this movie, too. But a lot of the oomph got taken out of it because, you know, you're expecting it. 
Anyway, what's yours? <laughs> Reviewing games from my childhood, and yes, I'm aware this will probably be a pretty niche thing, but I think a lot of people in my age range, millennials, will understand. So the very first computer game I ever played was on one of these, an Amiga computer. I grew up absolutely loving playing point-and-click adventure games. The first one I ever played was King's Quest VI. I will eventually talk about this one sometime down the road. But today I'm talking about one of my favorites, Phantasmagoria. So this was a point-and-click adventure game, and it was the first one I ever played that was FMV. Meaning you had an actual actor or actress as your primary character, but they're, you know, obviously walking around on a completely digitalized set. So it's all green screen. Ah, uh, look at the visual splendor. Mwah! Magnificent. It looks realistic. So realistic. So this was a horror game. Play a character named Adrian, and her and her husband move to this gigantic Victorian mansion. And as she continues to explore the mansion, she uncovers some dark, creepy secrets. And she starts to get these visions from the ghosts of people who used to live there and were killed there. And eventually, she unleashes some sort of demon into the house. And that's when her husband's behavior starts to change and become more crazy. So this was the original package for the game. It came on, I shit you not, seven CDs. And I believe this was a DOS game. Hey, here's a little clip. See, she just stands still until you tell her where to go. And point, click, point and click. Hurry! Ah, oh, the music. Mwah. Gorgeous, cinematic. Look at that, a visual splendor. You gotta help mom. Help! Help me! She needs a wide cast of characters. Take your time, Adrian. Yeah, no, we can, you can see what's, what's happening here. Just maybe get up there and help. You gotta tell her what to do, though. She won't do it on her own. You gotta click. It's a ladder, Adrian. Do you know how to use one? Just come on. Go. Jesus, take your time. She's gonna die. Old age. Anyway. So I, in the past few months or so, recently replayed this. I got it on Steam. I think you can also get it on goodoldgames.com. But yeah, this was a, a really entertaining game when I was a kid. I know it did scare the shit out of me when I was a kid. But now that I've replayed it, it is so corny. <laughs> so silly. I mean, everything about it is just bonkers, gooberish, cheesy. But that was what we had back then. FMV games were not very common. Gabriel Knight 2 is another example, which we'll talk about later. But even still, replaying it, um, it brought back a lot of uh, memories. It was very nostalgic. It's a creepy game still. The story is a little whatever. But as in one of the original point-and-click adventure games, it's, I don't know, I think it's still, it's still a fun game. You just have a different appreciation for it now as an adult. It's definitely graphic. It is, there are some very gory elements to this. If I was a kid reviewing this, I would probably say 10 out of 10. But as an adult who recently replayed it, I would say, you know, for what it was, 7 out of 10. There was a sequel, The Puzzle of Flesh, which is not good. It's not even remotely close to being what this was. Yeah, if you're like me and you want to kind of relive some of those moments from your youth, Steam and, and goodoldgames.com are great places to go to find some of these old school games. So check it out if you like, if you dare. Don't play it with the lights off. Or do. It's up to you. Okay, enjoy. Stitch this or comment below. What is your favorite Quentin Tarantino movie? I will go first. Tarantino just happens to be pretty much my favorite filmmaker. But my favorite movie he has ever done, and it's not even close. That's a bingo! <laughs> Inglorious Bastards is the closest thing to a perfect film I've ever seen. I can literally watch this movie over and over again, and I will never get bored of it. It has a fantastic cast, but, I mean, my God, Christoph Waltz, mwah, who plays Colonel Hans Landa, he is, I mean, to me, uh, uh, one of the best performances in a movie I've ever seen in my life. He is terrifying, but also hilarious. But Quentin Tarantino has this way about making a scene with no action be really exciting and intense. Tarantino is like the master of writing dialogue. The opening scene to this movie is like it, your heart is pounding and all it is is just two dudes talking. There was another thing with like that whole sequence at the bar that was primarily just talking, 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 but it was so intense. Like, I'm getting more intense until shit finally just happened. 
Anyway, what's it about, if you haven't seen it? Uh, Brad Pitt leads a group, a group of U.S. soldiers who are Jewish. They plan to essentially kill and take out any Nazi leader, including the big guy with the stash. And yeah, uh, it changes history. Just a skosh, just a bit. A lot of bit. <laughs> But it is just absolute perfection. It was nominated for Best Picture, Director, Screenplay. It won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. Christoph Waltz won. And Christoph Waltz also won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor for another Quentin Tarantino movie. My second favorite one, Django Unchained. Django Unchained is like a masterpiece. But again, it's just another movie where writing and dialogue is just so incredible his movies tend to be like super long like two and a half ish hour maybe even three hours long but they never feel like that long it's always like oh it's already over what the hell which ones haven't i seen um i don't know what the hell four rooms is i've never even heard of that i don't think i've ever seen jackie brown now that i'm thinking about it but oh i haven't seen death proof i don't really consider that a true tarantino movie but maybe you do i don't know love the kill bill movies kill bill volume one is so good. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was excellent. I really liked The Hateful Eight as just a movie, but as a Quentin Tarantino movie, it just didn't hit as well as most of his other movies did, if that makes sense. Loved it as a film, but as a Quentin Tarantino movie, I feel like I was kind of disappointed by him. Like he cares. <laughs> anyway, what's your favorite one? the fuck? Hey! And before you start with me, yeah, it has to do with her race. Because what? this is a story about Vikings! Look at the real Astrid. Blonde hair, blue eyes. That's a cartoon. You know, people love to throw out the term whitewashed a lot, but uh, I would really love to discuss what kind of color washing is happening to every live-action movie that comes Jesus. out now. Didn't need it. Oh. Definitely didn't need it. Whoa. Still don't want it. Okay. Here you guys are basically making the Lion King live-action with How to Train Your Dragon. Why are you because so angry? Because hiring real actors does not mean that you're not going to have to CGI half that fucking movie. That's not even the point. I was going to let go of the CGI thing when you weren't going to do another race swap. Okay. So about Can we true just to the calm down Do we have and to talk keep like normal? Them, because obviously no here, one because likes right them. now you're Except being really loud. That you're you're talking a lot. You're saying a lot of words. You're not letting me speak. You're not letting me get any word in. You're just blah, 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 blah. I'm a racist her. lady. Yeah, I'm a racist well, lady. Just say, I don't like black people. Just Honestly, say it, I lady. I mean, hey, I'm talking. Shut up. This is my turn to talk now. You are being very rude. I let you speak on your racism for the 30 seconds and then you're just... Interrupt me I'm trying to talk. You're insane. That we don't You're talk crazy. About black history cuckoo, 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 well, cuckoo, yeah, I'm done with you. Goodbye. I'm sorry, but what race were you expecting the green witch from fictional land of Oz to be? She's a green light. She's a green lady. She's always the character's always been a green lady. He's saying it has to be a white person underneath the green makeup. What? That's crazy. She's a green light. She's green. She's a witch. She's a green witch. She's not a real thing. She's not, she's fake. Never was, this not based on a true story. Maybe it's based on your life because you're kind of a motherfucker. Also, that's a cartoon, as many people have pointed out to you already. This is a cartoon lady. It's a, it's a movie about dragons. Dragons. Dragons, ma'am. It's a movie about dragons. Huh? They're not, there weren't Vikings who flew around on dragons in reality. Molly, Molly Mouse, who's, TikTok page is private. Wonder why? <sighs> I have to always ask myself, why do they get so angry? They got pissed off when a mermaid wasn't white. Now they're mad at green witches not being white. And now people who ride dragons, they're supposed to be white. As Good Trouble pointed out, Vikings aren't a race of people. They're not, a, they're not, Vikings, it's not like, uh, oh, what, oh, you're black, I'm Viking. It's not how it works. Who fucking cares? Ma'am? Ma'am? Hi, ma'am? Are oh, you still fucking busy yapping already? Are you not, what, are you silent? Oh, I have you paused, I'm sorry. Ready or not, here I come. What? Someone had recommended I watch this movie in a comment section, so I said, okay, let's find it. So this is the 2019 movie, Ready or Not. It is rated R, it's an hour and 35 minutes, and you can see that it clearly got a very positive reception. Grace couldn't be happier after she marries a man of her dreams at his family's luxurious estate. There's just one catch. She must now hide from midnight until dawn while her new in-laws hunt her down with guns, crossbows, and other weapons. As Grace desperately tries to survive the night, she soon finds 
a way to turn the tables on her not so lovable relatives. So I don't want to give too much away if you haven't seen this movie yet. It is available to watch on Hulu. But basically, uh, she's led to believe that the family has this tradition where they play some kind of game after a wedding that they have in the family. Sometimes it's Parcheesi, sometimes it's chess. But the game is chosen by this mysterious box that the dad has. And you put a blank card into this box and it pops out the game you're supposed to play. And so Grace chooses the game Hide and Seek. And this is not your friendly neighborhood game of Hide and Seek. And so now her new in-laws are armed to the teeth and they hunt her throughout the house as they are trying to incapacitate her for a special ceremony which has to happen before dawn or something will happen to them. I was not expecting this movie to be what it was. Again, I don't want to like give anything away. But their reasons and their motives for this is pretty demonic. By the way, I totally forgot about Adam Brody. But yeah, he's in this movie. What they didn't expect was that Grace was going to fight back. And I just want to say, this movie is fucking delightful. I am so glad that they recommended this movie, and I'm so glad I watched it. This was such... Um, it was a great movie. This was fantastic. The main actress, uh, Samara Weaving, who I believe is related to Hugo Weaving. You know, the guy from, like, Lord of the Rings and The Matrix. She is so she's so good in this movie the whole cast is fantastic and it's funny like it's not like a just a straight up horror movie like violence and all that it has a lot of great humor throughout it and it's not overused the the, the humor the comedy is used at like the best possible moments the story is unique it's different the concept is unique and different uh, for some reason, when I saw the poster for this, I thought it was going to be like that movie, You're Next. Another movie I really enjoyed. But it's really kind of not that at all. <laughs> I guess it has some similarities, but not really. This is not a slow-paced movie. It moves quickly. It's super fun. It's entertaining. It's, you know, not for kids, obviously, because it's a violent movie. There's a lot of, you know, blood. That final few moments, holy shit. <laughs> if you've seen it, that was explosive, huh? Really, really explosive. This is a must watch, in my opinion. If you have Hulu, you definitely should watch this. If you love horror movies, I would even say like, it's not it's not a slasher movie, but if you enjoyed that concept, this is probably something you would also really like because I fucking loved it. So out of a possible 100 crossbow bolts, I give this movie 99.5 exploding heads. So there you go. <laughs> really pushing the definition of Wonderland with you, Artie. <laughs> Boy, you say it isn't so out there today. You're crazy. It is um, coming down. Guys? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what have we done? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, Mike, I, I don't know. Ah, well, oh, I've been out shopping, and, and I got all the pr Christmas presents for, for everybody. I got one for, I got one. Uh, Dalton Trumbull's dialogue really sizzles, though. For uh, uh, Sam and uh, this, uh, I, I don't put this, I, I forgot the, I, I didn't, Oh, I, Grandpa oh, took I, the dog's I, heartworm I, medicine really, again. Really, that's uh, so <laughs> Is this how Oppenheimer felt when he watched the first A bomb test? Well, I, I better get these packages until I put the markers on because I don't know where the markers are. Now I'm going to get. Them. Whoops, I guess one of those bunnies still had some life in it. So that was from the guys at Rift Tracks. So here's an, an entertainment recommendation for you. But that uncomfortable clip I played at the beginning was from a movie called Wizzo's Christmas Circus that the guys at Rift Tracks dubbed their voices over to make fun of it. So if you're a millennial like me, you probably grew up with the show Mystery Science Theater 3000 and, you know, the classic silhouettes. But basically the premise is, like, there's a human on a space station who is forced to watch really bad, cheesy movies, and they have to talk over the movies and make fun of them. And he's joined by his robot companions, Tom Servo and Crow T. Robot. And yeah, see, they just do this. Classic image from the show. This was like my childhood, like every weekend. And you can actually watch, I think, a lot of the old Mystery Science Theater 3000 episodes on YouTube and other places. But in 2004, 2005 or so, uh, Mike Nelson, um, Kevin Murphy, and Bill Corbett 
brought back that medium of talking over bad movies and making fun of them through a thing they call riff tracks. They even do live ones now, which these are some of my favorite ones. They have a website you can go to. This is not a paid sponsor, but they do have a TikTok page. I'll link it. You can purchase and then download um, all these movies that already have the built-in riff audio. Or you can purchase just the audios for mainstream movies like Dune, Top Gun, Jurassic World, The Avengers, Star Wars, etc. Then they have a Rift Tracks app where you can take the audio on your phone and it'll sync up to the audio of the movie, kind of like Shazam. And on the Amazon Fire Stick, I haven't seen it on any other device. There's a Rift Tracks app for at least the Amazon Fire Stick where any movie you purchase will be on that app. You can just watch it through that. And for five bucks a month, you get part of their friends program and they give a, there's a whole fuck ton of movies and, and shorts that you get to watch as part of that program. You don't have to pay for any of them. Just the five bucks a month. So yeah, check it out. It just needs a bit more salt. I don't know if you're like me, but I, you know, I grew up watching like the Food Network cooking shows. I watched cooking channels on YouTube and whatnot. But one thing that has always consistently baffled me is salt. And what I mean is, is you see someone cooking these professional cooks, right? They are done preparing it. So they do the little spoon and the... Mm. Yeah, it needs a little bit more salt. And then they reach into their little fancy salt dish that we all have, of course. And they go like this to go... Little, little pinch. Boop, boop. Boom. Then... That was it. Yep, it's good. How, bitch? How? How did adding three granules of salt make the dish just pop? How? I can tell when something has too much salt, but maybe my taste buds are broken, but when I, you know, go to do a taste test, I can't tell if it doesn't have enough salt. But I know if I've oversalted it. I've also had kidney issues for like a large portion of my life, and so I don't usually add a bunch of extra salt, so maybe that's why. But you cannot tell me that adding a like four or five granules of uh, fancy salt to your giant pot of soup or chili or whatever made a big difference. How? How does it make a difference? How did that work? I can see if you like took this whole bowl, just fucking dumped it in there, and you're like, yeah, that was, that, that was it, yep. But a couple little specks? No, no, I refuse to believe that's accurate or true. Anyway, that's just a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> Name one of your favorite childhood shows. Don't think, just say it. Or think, and then say it. Here's mine. Grandpa, the water. We hold you in our hearts. And when we think about you, it makes me want to fart. <laughs> it's I hope we never part. Now get it right or pay the price. Oh yeah. All right, Gen Z. We had... We had this. This was this was our Nickelodeon right here. Along with, hey, dude. This is another one of those shows, like with Mr. Bean, that I thought had gone on for literally ever, for like eight, nine seasons. It was only two seasons. It had like, what was it, 20-something episodes? What? I feel like I watched this every, like, week for, for years. No, I guess not. So it's a show that takes place at a, at a kid's camp called Camp Anawana. And it's uh, run by this guy here, Ugg. And the kids just get in hijinks and shit. I think you could actually watch this now, maybe on YouTube. And I'm wondering if I want to like rewatch it. But then I know if I watch it, I'm going to go, wow, this was fucking stupid. And then my childhood will be ruined. I don't want to ruin my childhood. I want to continue believing that this was an Emmy caliber sitcom. It was from 1990 to 1992. So I was... Five or six years old when the show started. Man, Nickelodeon back in the day, though. Ugh. You had this. You had Hey Dude, Doug, Rugrats, Rocco's Modern Life. We had our cool game shows like Double Dare. And, of course, Legends of the Hidden Temple. I miss those times. Those innocent, innocent times. Anyway, what's one of your favorite childhood shows? This goes out to all generations. Have any of you guys watched the show Slasher? So I just found out about the show a couple of days ago. It's been on Netflix since like 2016. I don't know if that's where it originally aired, but I know that the first three seasons are on Netflix and then there's two other seasons that I don't know exactly where they are just yet. But I'm watching these. I'm watching these, these seasons. And like, I like the concept. I really do. It's like American Horror Story, but slasher story. 
So each season is its own separate season, its own separate story. They're not really connected. You have a whole different cast of characters for the for the next season. Sometimes you have actors from the previous season who are in the next one, just playing different people. And the first two seasons so far that I watched are eight episodes apiece. Um, like I I I like the idea of this show. I really do. The first season though was like. I had a hard time getting through it because the main actress, I'm sure she's delightful everywhere else, but like I couldn't get through that. Like clearly she has an accent and was not really great at hiding it. And I don't know, it just felt like it was distracting. <laughs> and I, I kind of guessed who the killer was like four episodes in, but I did not guess the killer in the second season, uh, which I just finished. So the first season's about like this woman, she returns uh, back to her hometown. And she moves into the house where her parents were brutally murdered. And herself, she would have been cut out of her mom's stomach because her mom was pregnant with her. And the killer removed the baby from the stomach, before, you know, then he killed her. But then she comes back into town and all of a sudden these murders start happening again. And it's a guy dressed up as the executioner who was the same person who dressed up as when the, you know, her parents were killed. But you know it's not him because that guy's in jail. And it really does the whole, like, seven deadly sins thing and then the second season has more of like a friday the 13th kind of feel because it takes place at an old summer camp that's been turned into some like yoga you know peaceful retreat type thing but like five years prior some a young you know girl disappeared presumed murdered and the people who were involved in her disappearance come back five years later to find her body so that they can move it. That's not really a spoiler. I and mean, that's actually the actual premise of the season. But then everyone starts getting brutally killed by someone donned up in this like ski suit. But that's all I've watched so far. I mean, I've, I like the second season way more than the first one. So uh, season three and on is uh, to be determined. But like, it's not, I wouldn't call this like a good show, you know, but I wouldn't say it's a bad show. It's one of those you're like, yeah, it's worth a watch, you know, especially if you're into slasher stuff or, you know, whodunit kind of murder mysteries. You might find this to be you know, at least borderline enjoyable, like good for a one-time watch. Like, I'll never watch these seasons again, I can tell you that. But I like them just enough to like say, okay, it was decent, the concept is cool. So yeah, if you're a fan of like horror slashers, give it a watch. First three seasons are on Netflix. You might like it. So I wanted to recommend a couple of little short films that a buddy of mine here on TikTok, I'm, you know, mutual with him, that he made. The creator I'm talking about is Static Jones. I'm sure some of you probably know who he is. I know he does a lot of, you know, political content, but he's also an independent filmmaker. Now, I knew you did independent films, sir. I knew you did shorts and stuff. I did not know you acted in them. And like, uh, I want to tell you, no, no joke or anything. I think you're actually really good. <laughs> So one of them is called Silent Breath. And by the way, I'm going to link the three I'm talking about. I'm going to link them in my link tree, which is just in my bio. And it's towards the, the bottom of the link tree. So this one's basically about a kid who is being told what to do by what his parents think are the voices in his head. But like you see the actual person who is the voice in his head. And this one, The Closet, well, I'll just say it's about a monster in a closet. And then there's this one, The Hicksorcists. So I think this one was meant to be like off the wall silly, but it's like delightfully cheesy, you know? And I definitely, I laughed a few times for sure. <laughs> Basically, it's about demonic possession um, in the hillbilly community. So all three of these I would definitely put into the horror genre, or maybe the last one, like a comedy horror. But for being essentially like amateur films, honestly, I, I liked all three of them. I do want to be honest though, because I don't want to like lie, but some of the acting uh, may not have been like super great. But again, you sir are, you are good in these. I did not know you possessed acting chops, sir. But yeah, I definitely think they're worth a watch. I mean, the first two are like, one's 15 minutes. I think this one's like 10 minutes. This one is actually the longest one. It's about 45 minutes or so. I watched all of them in just one fell swoop. And it was a good way to pass time. I was entertained. So if you go to my link tree, which is in my bio, um, towards the very bottom, you will, and there are not many links on there, but you'll see uh, the three movies I'm talking about. So check them out. Uh, give uh, Static Jones here a follow. Subscribe to his YouTube channel. And yeah, so there you go. Enjoy. This movie was fantastic. 
So I watched the movie Ready or Not the other day, and I was curious what uh, Samara Weaving, what else she had been in. So I was looking through her filmography, and I saw this movie, The Babysitter, and I saw that it was on Netflix. And I heard it was some sort of horror movie, so I said, okay, I'll watch it. I've been reviewing a lot of horror movies recently. I promise I watched more than that. It's just I've been on some weird binge with horror stuff. I, 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 don't, I don't know why. So real quick, it's an hour and 25 minutes long, and it got pretty positive reviews across the board. When Cole stays up past his bedtime, he discovers that his hot babysitter belongs to a satanic cult that will stop at nothing to keep him quiet. So basically, this kid, uh, Cole, is like obsessed with his babysitter. He's like in love with her. And the plot of the movie is that she's coming over for the weekend to babysit him while his parents are out of town. While he's trying to go to bed, he hears people downstairs and he soon finds out, like the plot said, that his babysitter is actually part of a satanic cult. And so from that point moving forward, the rest of the movie is him trying to escape this cult and also trying to kill them because they're trying to kill him. <laughs> it's got Bella Thorne. This guy, I think he was on Vine or YouTube early on. King, I think his name was King Bach. But he's hilarious in it. The movie really is kind of a, a comedy. It's a dark comedy, a horror comedy. I've been watching a lot of horror comedies lately too. Huh. And like with Ready or Not, the comedy was used the perfect amount in this movie. Like this was not a horror movie you took at all seriously. It's completely silly. It's ridiculous. But it's a lot of fun. Like this was a really entertaining movie. I was laughing uh, repeatedly. It moved along really quickly. There was really no slow parts of the movie. It's just funny seeing this like 12 year old kid who's in love with his, you know, older babysitter. And now he's like trying to get away from her slash possibly trying to kill her to save himself. Like I said, it's on Netflix. So if you have it, you can watch it that way. And there actually is a sequel apparently, uh, which I think is probably on Netflix as well. I haven't watched it yet. I'm going to at this point. I just don't know when. If you've never seen it, you know, it's only an hour and 25 minutes long. It's just a highly entertaining movie. It's not great. It certainly is not bad. I just thought this was a good movie. So out of a possible 666 pentagrams, I give this movie 642 gunshot wounds to the boob. So there you go. Are these the same movie, right? These are the same movie. Yeah. So I recently watched Time Cut, which is a Netflix movie premiered just a couple months ago. It's about a teen in 2024 accidentally time travels to 2003, days before a masked killer murders her sister. Can she change the past without destroying the future? Obviously, it got pretty panned on all angles. And I agree, uh, I did not like this movie. <laughs> so, spoiler alert if you haven't seen this, okay? What I don't understand is that they, I guess, prevented this person from committing these murders. But the reason the person did it was essentially because mentally they were pushed to the edge. Which doesn't that mean that that's not a person you should probably just walk away and go, oh, let's go get a drink, huh? Like when they find out who it is, they do nothing to help that individual in this, in the timeline where they haven't actually committed any murders yet, but that person still has that ability. Am I overthinking? I'm overthinking this. If you've seen the movie, do you know what I mean? Do you understand? It's just, it was just so dumb. So last year, around the same time on Prime, on Amazon Prime is where you can watch this one, another movie called Totally Killer came out. 35 years after the shocking murder of three teens, the infamous Sweet 16 killer returns on Halloween night to claim a fourth victim. 17-year-old Jamie ignores her overprotective mom's Julie Bowen warning and comes face-to-face -face with the masked maniac Anne. On the run for her life, accidentally time travels back to 1987, the year of the original killings, forced to navigate the unfamiliar not race culture of the 1980s. Jamie teams up with her teen mom uh, to take down the killer once and for all before she's struck, stuck in this time forever. So this one came out first. And as you can see, it got a lot more love. But it is a time travel slasher horror movie. Which I, I definitely liked this one more than Time Cut. But I still didn't really like it. I could see myself watching this movie again, though. But I couldn't, I would never watch Time Cut again. Like, ever. Because I think this one was just, it was fresh, it was different. And maybe that's why I didn't like the other one. Just because it was like, it's the same shit. But you know what both of these movies reminded me of? They reminded me of a much better f much? a much better film series, the Happy Death Day series. I absolutely love these two movies. Happy Death Day is basically like Groundhog Day, but in slasher horror movie fashion. The girl basically is reliving the same day over and over again. She keeps keep getting murdered at the end of each day. And then once she gets murdered, she wakes up back in the same day to start all over again. It's a really great combination of being funny and being kind of like a, 
a more light uh, slasher movie, like a lighter theme, I guess. I don't know. It's clever. It was different. Very entertaining. I've watched this movie a few times now. Um, and then Happy Death Day to You was the sequel with the exact same cast on the same set. But this one focused more on the time travel thing. So it took this concept of its own thing and turned it into something a little bit different and more unique. And it still works really well. Uh, the main uh, actress in these movies, she is she's so good. And if you've never seen them, I definitely would recommend you watch these movies before you watch those other ones. Both of these, I don't think you can stream them for free anywhere, though. I believe you still have to purchase them, like on Amazon Prime. But yeah, much better movies than these two were. But if you're going to watch either one of these, I would definitely recommend this one over this one. Because this one played with the whole concept of like a, a Gen Z or going back to the 80s. They played it way better uh, with a more uh, comedic kind of turn than they try to pull off with this. Anyway, that's just my opinion, though. Maybe you loved them both or I don't know. I'm just that, That's why we all have our own opinions, right? Okay. Because my movie one went so well, let's blind rank some TV shows. Well, I'm not going to start with this one. I'm going to hit stop and then record again because I've never seen The Wire. Oh, look at that. Oh, my God. Brand new. <laughs> the Outsider? I don't even know what that is. Why can't I? Oh, wait. Oh, I can stop. Ha! <laughs> look at that. I cheated. Okay. <sighs> Minus the last three episodes of season eight. Or just season eight. Um, I did love, okay, yell at me all you want, but I love the battle uh, at Winterfell, the, the dark episode that no one can see, one of my favorite episodes of all time. Anyway, number one. <laughs> Sorry, that long explanation. South Park? Oh, see, now I can't stop and reset because it'll reset number one. Shit! I don't, I don't watch South Park. Five, sorry. Peaky Blinders? I haven't seen that show either. I know you're going to say, oh my god, you've never seen it. You should say it. And I'm like, okay, I'll watch it. Then I'll just forget and I'll never watch it. So four, because I didn't have a choice. What is this? The Outsider? Why don't you get outside of this fucking ranking? Because I don't know what you are. Ugh. Sopranos. Never watched it. I know. You're going to be like, what the fuck, Mike? And I'm going to be like, I know. And I'm going to be like, uh... <sighs> what... Well, this is bullshit. <coughs> oh, jeez, what happened? I got to reset the whole thing. Okay, let's try again. Uh, whoops. Some finger slipped a couple times. House of Cards. No. <laughs> bye bye. Okay, let's try. Fucking on your CEO. <sighs> okay. Sun's never seen it. Never seen it. Sorry. Uh, okay, you know what? You need to fuck outside of the. Fuck. Okay, we're going to try this again. Okay. From scratchy sc Kevin Spacey, get the fuck out of my life. <sighs> I don't think this is ever going to go my way. The Simpsons. I've seen some. So there, there's a start. Five. I like Family Guy better. Whatever. Sons of Anarchy. God damn it. Four. Never seen it. <laughs> Game of Thrones, number one. <laughs> what? I didn't see that one before. Peaky Are there four shows on this entire list? Who made this list? Fuck. Homeland, God damn it, Claire Danes. I don't want you in my life. I've never seen you. See, look at that. Mm, go away. Stop it. Oh my goodness. Fuck. Stop. <sighs> well, this was unstable. <clears throat> what? Okay. All right. You know what? Go fuck yourself. My top five favorite TV shows of all time. Well, I'm actually going to give you ten because choosing five is really hard. Keep in mind, these are TV shows, obviously, that I've seen. You may have shows that you love that are not on this list, probably because I haven't seen them. Coming in at number 10, Boston Legal. A legal drama comedy, a spinoff from the legal drama, The Practice. I'm not going to go into too many details about each show, because eventually I'll make a video on all of these individually. But just James Spader, fucking lights out amazing on this show. Coming in at number 9, of course, Mystery Science Theater 3000. This show was like my entire childhood. And now it's back in the form of Riff Tracks. Check it out. Number eight, Community. It is my favorite half hour comedy show of all time. I can rewatch this show a hundred times. Number seven, Lost. I know, it's a show that lost many of us in terms of knowing what the fuck was going on. But for that reason, it's so memorable. It's an absolutely bonkers show. And trying to explain the plot, my head would explode. Number six, Stranger Things. 
To me, this is one of those shows that started off really fucking strong and has just stayed strong the entire time. Like that last season, the season four, was phenomenal. And I am just so excited for season five. You know, whenever it premieres in 2062. <laughs> All right, top five. Number five, Battlestar Galactica. I actually made a video on this just the other day. If you wanna go check it, go ahead and ch check it. Mother frackers, go frack yourselves. <laughs> Space drama, end of the world type thing, technology adapting and rebelling against the human race. What could go wrong? Number four, The X-Files, baby. Mulder and Scully to me are like the best television duo in the history of the television sets. Huh? Huh? Seasons one through like six were absolutely fantastic. Seasons seven, eight, nine were good, but it really began to take a dip, especially by season nine. The newer seasons that came out recently were okay, but I'm gonna be honest, if it came out with another season, I'd be totally excited to watch it still. Number three, and this is kind of a surprising one to a lot of people maybe because it was only on for one season, The Haunting of Hill House. This is here because this was one of the most surprising shows I have ever seen in my life. I was fully expecting this just to be some stupid horror show about ghosts and shit, but it was so much more than that. It was a show about dysfunctional family, addiction, death. It was so well written. And, and this show was just like one of those that really made you feel like emotional. It was just so beautifully done. Like it just this show is just so fucking surprisingly amazing. Number two, of course, Breaking Bad. This is another show that started off good and then it became better and better. But what's most captivating about this show, and this will be a spoiler alert if you've never seen it, is how the character development of Walter White was something I've never seen before on TV. He goes from like this bumbling teacher who you root for, who's like the hero of the show, and he slowly becomes the villain of the show. You go from rooting for him, wanting him to live, to the very end, you're like, God, I hope this fucking guy dies. It's just so... Brian Cranston, I just, I don't even know how the fuck he did it. Ozymandias, the season five episode, one of the single greatest television episodes in the history of the world. The world. And of course, number one, Game of Thrones. Even with, even with season eight, yes. Personally, I only thought the final three episodes of season eight were absolute utter garbage. I actually kind of enjoy the first three episodes of season eight. Really, the, the last final great episode was the Battle at Winterfell episode. That was it. That was when it should have just, that should have been the end somehow, some way. But no, we got Khaleesi going fucking crazy, killing a whole bunch of people. Just, just ruining her character, just ruining everything, everything. It's like the writers were like, you know what, um, we are busy doing other things, so let's just have our kids write the script the final season, and we'll just fucking film it, whatever. Like, how do you start off with the most talked about, the most loved, the show that wins award after award after award, that is just so consistently phenomenal to just completely jumping off a cliff? You were there. You were right there. The show, you were at the end. This was it. There's no way you could have screwed this up. But they fucking did. Ugh. But despite that, I have never seen television more incredible than this. And I don't know if I ever will ever again. Except for season eight. <laughs> anyway, that's my long video. Sorry, but there you go. Did this movie suck? No, it did not suck. But it blew. <laughs> I'm kidding. It didn't blow either. Shut up, Mike. Okay. Anyway, quick side note, I think I'm going to retitle this playlist Mikey at the Movies for the reviews I do. It has a nice little ring to it. So Twisters is the sort of kind of sequel to the 1996 movie Twister, a classic 90s action movie that us millennials love very much. So I was a little skeptical, thinking that they were going to take this series and ruin it, but I was very, very pleasantly surprised. So it stars Daisy Edgar-Jones and Glenn Powell. Glenn Powell kind of plays the likable version of the Carrie Elwes character from the first movie. And I would say Daisy Edgar Jones sort of has the Bill Paxton role. Like the, uh, oh, I'm done chasing storms, except for this one last time. So Daisy Edgar Jones' character, basically she lost most of her entire tornado chasing team. They all got sucked into a twister. And so she's like, I'm giving up this life. But then she gets lassoed back into it. 
So the first movie was about them creating a system that they could give a longer warning to people that a tornado was coming. This one is kind of, they're doing something similar, but they're trying to uh, track a tornado's path, but also find a way to kill and dissipate a twister. So the formula is, a, is the same as Twister. I would almost describe this not as a sequel because it doesn't really mention anything to do with the first movie, except they do have the Dorothy thing. I would say this was more of like a really soft reboot. Just taking the 90s movie and sort of redoing it for a more modern audience. And honestly, I think it worked well. I kind of wanted to not like it, but I ended up really enjoying it. Glenn Powell and Daisy Edgar Jones are delightful. They are a great little team. The visuals are very stunning. It's intense. It's action-packed. You know, if you're looking for something fresh and new and original, you're not really going to get a lot of that with this. But it still does enough to make it kind of its own thing. Sometimes for me personally, and I know a lot of you probably think the same way, I just want to watch a movie that's just pure entertainment. I don't really need anything else from it. I just need something to entertain me, something fun. And that is what Twisters is. It's just a fun movie, highly entertaining. And I liked it a lot. And so did pretty much everyone else. So the movie is rated PG-13. It's about two hours long. It's got a 75% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, which is good. And then 91% of moviegoers liked it. So it doesn't do anything new or original, but it's just a lot of fun. And I would definitely recommend it. I watched this um, a little while back. I paid for it on Amazon, but I think now if you have Peacock, from what I understand, it's now available on Peacock. So check it out. If you're a fan of the original movie, I think you might be a fan of this one too. Remembering movies from my childhood. Hello. <clears throat> Do you all remember this movie from 1995, Village of the Damned? It was a remake of a 1960 movie, which was based on a 1957 book called The Midwich Cuckoos. I was about 10 years old when this came out. Man, my parents let me watch all sorts of crazy movies. I turned out normal, huh? It's got Luke Skywalker, that one lady from that one TV show, and it's got Superman, Christopher Reeves back there. This was one of his last movie roles, actually. What's it about? So it takes place in the town of Midwich, when one day, all of a sudden, the entire town blacks out. They all collapse, and they are all out cold for several hours. Suddenly they come to, they have really no idea what the hell happened. And then very soon after this, 10 different women are pregnant, including some who should not be pregnant. So they're all considered miracle babies. That's when Kirstie Alley's character comes in. She's some sort of medical person. I can't remember exactly what her role was, but she's there to like study this crazy phenomenon and to help, you know, birth these babies. The kids are born and eventually they grow into these little demons. And then some crazy shit starts happening around town. These kids seem to be running the joint. Anytime they get mad, they stare directly at the person they're mad at and their eyes start glowing and get all bright and crazy shiny. And the person they're staring at suddenly does something to themselves, like harms themselves or ends their own life by sticking their hands in like pots of water, jumping off cliffs, all sorts of crazy shit. Yeah, see? Turns out these kids, these miraculous births, were not, uh, were not, were not human babies. They were some sort of alien beings that were put into these women. This little crazy nut job's the ringleader. She's Christopher Reeve's daughter in the movie. But yeah, one by one, they just start making these townspeople off themselves. They create police officers to have big shootouts amongst themselves. And then it's up to Christopher Reeves to blow them all up. That's right, blow up a bunch of kids. Don't worry, they're not real kids. I have not seen this movie in a very long time, but I just somehow came across it uh, recently. And I was like, holy shit, I, I almost forgot about this movie. I remember really liking it as, as a younger person. I don't know if I would watch it now and go, oh yeah, this movie is still good. But it's a sci-fi horror movie. I mean, you know, sure, it's, it's okay, I guess, right? From what I remember. I'm sure we'll be getting a reboot or a remake at some point soon, right? But yeah, have you all seen this before? What did you think of it? Out of 10 pairs of glowing children's eyes, I would probably give it nine pairs of dirty socks. So there you go. I don't know what that rating was. Folks, I have good news and bad news. Found them. <laughs> Looks like that sentient candy cane ass bitch can't run from the scope of my sniper rifle. All that squinting over all those years. He cannot hurt anybody's eyes ever again. What's a movie you hate that a lot of people seem to love? I'll go first. La La Land, you piece of sh**. This movie should have been an abortion. 
There was not a single second, not a single millisecond of this movie that I enjoyed. They should have named this movie, Hey Mike, Go F*** Yourself Land. Because that's how I felt the movie was towards me. I feel like I was that scene in that Dahmer TV show where Dahmer puts the VCR tape in and he's like, Hey, we're gonna watch this. And it was this. This is the sh he made me watch. Why did I hate it? I don't even know. I just did. I hated it. With a passion. When at the Academy Awards, right, when Dick Tracy and that one broad uh, opened the envelope and said best picture goes to La La Land. And then there was all that commotion where it actually was Moonlight who won because those old people couldn't read the card. I felt so much joy and elation in my entire soul. I was thrilled. I was thrilled that they all went on stage. Oh, <laughs> we won. Just kidding. No, we didn't. I've never seen Moonlight. I probably should. I couldn't stay in this movie. Honorable mention, Les Miserables. The movie version. I haven't seen any other versions, so this is the only one I've seen. Hey, you don't need to sing every f***ing line of your life. I'm going to the store to get some mayonnaise. Are you running out of tampons? I can get some for you. Listen, John Bell, Jack, John, John, uh... John Bon Jovi or some shit? I don't fucking know his name. Like, there's some things you don't need to sing about. Like, most things. Like, everything. Every This movie was 362 hours long, and every second of it was painful. It took me a year to watch this movie in full. Anne Hathaway won an Oscar for this movie. She was in it for nine seconds. Well, I wasn't less miserable at the end of this movie. I was more, more miserables. Miserables. I was more... I was... I was more... I wanted someone to shoot me in the face. That's what I wanted. I wanted someone to walk into my room and just blow my head off. Because that would have been less painful than watching this movie. I'm not super keen on the death penalty, but La La Land should definitely have been sentenced to death. Anyway, what's yours?